We're not able to visit distilleries. We're not able to go to those festivals. We're not able to go on these tours. But we can pour a dram. We can still hang out with each other. And we can dream about it. Hello, whiskey folk. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to another VPUB. Welcome to another Thursday night. Welcome to um, a room full of whiskey community. It's fantastic to see so many of you in, so many of you waiting outside the pub doors before it even opened. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here. I know it's difficult for everybody right now because lots of us are going through various levels of quarantine, of uh, social distancing, or perhaps self-isolation, or whatever it is. But still, we can find these little pockets of time where we don't need to talk about all of that stuff. We don't need to mention the C word and the challenges and the craziness that the world is facing right now. And we can just lose ourselves a little bit in a bit of whiskey and a bit of whiskey community. So welcome everybody here. Tonight's theme, these VPUBs usually have some kind of theme. Um, and the theme tonight is really that kind of idea that we are kind of visiting some distilleries on a kind of little route plotted around the, the Queen of the Hebrides, the island of Isla everybody's kind of favourite whiskey destination, right? Um, it's easy to talk too much about Isla, but there's a reason that we all love it so much because we all connect with the island so much and we certainly connect with the whiskey that it produces as well. And it's that nice little compact size that we can get together and kind of do a quick whistle stop tour around the distilleries and pause at a couple of them and share a dram and talk about it for a little while. And in order to do that, we have kind of virtual hosts tonight and I've plucked people from the community, barflies, uh, people uh, that you'll recognize their names and things from either literally from the lounge, from the, the live chat, or for maybe somewhere else in uh, the social media scene. I'll take you through that in a wee second. But the idea is, is that these guys um, hang out with us for a little while and talk about that distillery, why it's perhaps their favorite Isla distillery and what they love about it and give us a bit of a human connection there, a bit of a human story rather than uh, cut points and uh, production stats and things like that. So I hope that that sounds like it might be a bit of fun. Can I just say at the outset, however, that this is in no way intended to encourage anybody to go and visit Isla. That would be a really bad idea. I really love the tweet that came out from David Brody on Twitter earlier this week, where he was talking about people who thought that they were doing the brave thing by continuing their journey at the end of March and the start of April. And his words literally were, you'll be as welcome as a fart in a spacesuit. Don't do it. Don't come. Everything is closed and the island will be jeopardized. It'll be put in danger by you traveling. And that's the same, not just for Isla, but everywhere right now. It's not clever. Uh, to physically visit these places anywhere right now. But you can do it with us, so come along with us instead. Um, I also want to talk about, um, uh, well, I'll take you through who our hosts are going to be in a little while, but I want to talk about um, the idea of a kind of virtual community and virtual connection. All of this week, I've been in various discussions with lots of people that want to do what we've been doing for a long time now in the VPUB, and that's sharing whiskey virtually. And the reason for that is obviously because we're all confined a little bit and uh, technology is proving very, very beneficial for us to reach out and still connect. Um, but whiskey producers want to do that as well. And their entire calendar in springtime and, and summer and, and for, for the foreseeable future has been wiped clean. Um, so I've been in discussions with uh, a Scott from Tomatin actually this week who's spearheading this. He's rallying a lot of producers and things. Um, you know, uh, companies that you would imagine that might compete with each other, but in order to kind of get together and collaborate a little bit and come together to try and find ways to celebrate whiskey virtually in a kind of virtual environment. And they're coming up with this concept of um, a lockdown whiskey festival where one of the channels, it looks like it's going to be the Tomatin channel to start with, will host a virtual whiskey festival and they'll pull in lots of other whiskey producers, whiskey distilleries, brand ambassadors, that kind of thing, and let 
the people in the community um, connect with them and ask very uh, direct questions that interests them. Now, what I think the benefit there, what it brings for us is that where we lose that whiskey sharing, where we can't f share a physical dram, they can't pour one of their whiskies for us. So we kind of lose that in a virtual environment. But I think what we gain is global reach and inclusion and people that normally don't get to get along to festivals, that don't get to connect with these brand ambassadors, with these uh, representatives, with these bottlers, with these impassioned uh, whiskey people in the industry, I think it gives that um, it gives them a good chance to do it in that platform, and I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, there will be more news to follow. If I can try to grab my messages, I might even be able to give you the very latest of the people that's involved in that. It's kind of cool. They're calling it the Lockdown Whiskey Festival, and I can tell you that uh, some of the companies on board already are obviously Tomatin, Ben Riach, Tom and Towel, Glenn Cadham. Um, I know that Adelphi are involved, Kilhoman are involved. Let me see who else. Uh, There are a few producers here. I'm going back to the chat just to see where they all are. I should have had this list prepared. I didn't imagine that I'd be sharing it with you. Glen Allah here also involved. Aaron, Glen Morey, Kilkerran, Paul John. Lots of producers stepping up and getting together. And they'll be able to do this all in one session or they'll be able to potentially do a kind of round robin thing or break it up and do it in multiple sessions. So I think that that's a good idea. Okay, let's uh, welcome some of you fantastic barflies before we start our little trip around the island of Isla. Welcome in a couple of members here. Who do we have? Who's joined uh, the barfly community tonight to get access to those nice emojis? Uh, Gareth uh, Thomason, welcome to Aquavitae Barflies, Gareth. Fantastic to have you on board as well as just joining us there is James McGoran. James, fantastic. I know you're down in Australia. It must be very early in the morning where you are just now. Let's see who else is joining us here. Mark Slinger from up in Speyside. Good to see you, Mark. Simon Ray down south. Gordon Finney is in as well. Good to see you, Gordon. Reb Mordecai over in Israel. Fantastic, Reb. Good to see you. Malt Monk, that's Justin. He's saying Aquavita. Good evening, Roy. And to all the barflies, he's sipping a Lagavulin 16-year-old. A perfect start for tonight, Justin. Welcome in, my friend. Gregor McQueen, Oregon, is here saying, I'm straight up asking Glenn Goyne on theirs why they felt it was okay to, them price, to increase the price in teapot so heavily. We've already discussed that point a few times. There was quite a big step change there. I know they were using some older stock in there as well. And I know that it's a very unique thing. I went in a bit of a huff about it, but I know what's going to happen. I'm going to just suck her up and end up going up and buying a bottle of the Batch 7. I just I love it so much. Um, but it's expensive, or it's more expensive than it's been in the past. Absolutely, Gre Gregor, I agree with you. Eric Evanson is here. Sam Clark is here. Paul Gibbs, Scotty, Kilted Moose, fantastic. Billy Saunders, Scotch on the Bayou, Leanne, all the way out in Louisiana, fantastic. Multi-mission, Menno. Menno, I hope you're feeling a wee bit better. I know you were under the weather recently, and I hope you haven't succumbed. Um, I'm hoping that you're healthy tonight and enjoying a nice dram. Luna Aaron is here, dancing midgy. Good to see you, Glenn. Richie, uh, Richie Z is here, Hoyt Hempel. Eric is in as well. Eric Cunliffe is saying, Aquavide, hello. Excited to tour with everyone. Thank you. Sipping a Buna 18 and Brookladdy 10, um, second edition. Sounds like you're perfectly on theme tonight, Eric. Welcome in, my friend. Radek, superb to see you, Radek. Daniel Gray, I have a very small amount of my only Isla left, which I've been nursing, a more 15. But in the spirit of this theme, I might break into it again tonight. You have to, Daniel. You have to get in the spirit of it. You can have a more 15, while I don't tonight. And we'll get to that a wee bit later. Whiskey-loving pianist is in, Chris Mir Gel Gelchich. Chris Mir, I always make a mess of your surname. I do hope you, you, you forgive me, my friend. Andy C over in East Kilbride. Hope you're feeling a wee bit better, Andy. Eric Evanson, Steve A. Steve Anderson is in. Good to see you, Steve. Neil Cochran, my friend from Glasgow. Peter Box, Michael Sunday Evening Scotch, Jimmy Jazz, Jimmy Leg, of course. Um, Rolf over in Norway, McAllen Fine and Rare the Docks. So many of you joining. Fantastic to welcome so, so many of you in for a wee tour around Isla. So let me tell you the plan tonight. We're going to start off at our beg. So this is not about kind of planning out the, the flight based on ABV. 
or based on um, you know the PTist being at the end and the least PT being at the beginning. No, we're just going to be skipping all over the place a little bit and relaxing with it a bit. I'm going to be starting with Ardbeg in the south of the island. And our host there will be somebody who you all recognise from the community, a gentleman who is Andy Purslow, Ard Baggy, you know him as. And he's been a long-term fan and collector of all things Ardbeg, hence the handle Ard Baggy. After that, we'll carry on down the Condalton coast. We'll pass Lefroy quickly. I'll pause quickly with you. We don't have a host for Lefroy tonight, um, but I'll uh, make mention of Lefroy before we move on to Lagavulin. And at Lagavulin, our host at Lagavulin is another member from the community, and that is the Doc, McAllen Fine and Rare, my friend from Germany. And he is a passion, passionate fan of Lagavulin. He's going to spend a little bit of time sharing Lagavulin with us. After that, we'll pass the sites of, I guess, uh, the, the forthcoming Port Ellen, also passing the sites of the kind of always work in progress planning stage type distilleries of Gartbreck and Farkin and the Port Ellen Maltings. We'll pass those completely by and head up to Bamore. After Bamore, we'll skip over Loch and Dal to Brookladdy, where we'll be welcomed by somebody else, and that is Ben, Single Malt Alliance from Instagram. Ben, also an ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. You've seen him on the channel before. He's a gentleman and a friend, and he's also a big fan of Brookladdy, so he'll welcome us there. We'll make a quick pit stop over towards Machir Bay at Kilhoman, and we'll make our way back over to the northeast of the island to visit Kalila. Now, sad news about Kalila. Roddy, who was supposed to be sat next to me tonight for this VPUB, uh, Roddy, who was uh, with me in December, we had a fantastic time together. Um, but obviously the, with the isolation thing, we couldn't get together in the same room, so he was going to tune in remotely and he was going to host Kalila. Um, but he's feeling poorly. He's got a temperature, he's got a bit of a, a head on, I think, and he's got um, a dry cough. He says he's treating himself with paracetamol and Werther's original. I've suggested that he has a wee cast strength whiskey as well, and I hope he gets better soon. Roddy, I hope you do get better soon, my friend. We miss you tonight, and we'll see you very soon on the VPUB. To your health, Roddy. After that, we'll head up to our last stop on Isla, passing Ardnaho Distillery, the new distillery there. Of course, they've got no product out to talk about yet. Um, but we'll make note, quick note of Ardnaho as we head on to Buna Haven. And our last host of the evening will be Scott from the Scotch Test Dummies, who's going to drop in and talk about um, some recent epiphanies that he's had with uh, Buna Haven. There's a lot to do. I can't, uh, usually we target two hours on these streams. <laughs> I fail it regularly um, without it being as crammed as what we're attempting tonight. So, uh, Bear with me. Just before we get we kick off and we head off to, to meet Andy down at Ardbeg, um, something really kind of almost emotional happened in our street tonight. We live in quite a residential street. The, the houses are uh, they're fairly close to each other, but not so close. It's not like we're in apartments or anything. Um, but as I was setting up tonight and, and getting organised, there was a kind of round of applause that went out at 8 o'clock UK time. And this is this round of applause that's happening all around the world. Uh, my wife shouted down to me, did we hear it? Um, I, I, and that's that's a very cool thing, that that kind of community thing. I don't know, um, I don't know how people feel about it that are actually on the front line. I don't know how people um, are receiving it, but um, it's meant in the very, very... Uh, best of human spirit, I think, and I think it's a wonderful thing. And I want to kind of raise a wee glass of, of whiskey, not just for everybody in healthcare and on the front line that's dealing with these really difficult times, but if you're picking up my litter, my garbage from my front door, if you're delivering my things here, if you're keeping your shop open, if you are caring for people, the hundreds and thousands and millions of people all over the world that are still getting up and would perhaps secretly like a little bit of downtime, home, self-isolating. I'm going to raise a glass just to say thank you from me, thank you from, I hope, my community um, for everything that you're all doing. Um, it goes without saying that it could not function without you all. It's very much appreciated. Thank you to you all. Okay, let's lift spirits a wee bit. And let's head off down to the Kildalton coast and the south coast of Isla. 
And for this, I'm going to bring in a friend of mine. This is somebody that I've got to know over the last couple of years. He was introduced to me through uh, Whiskey Jason. Um, sorry, not Whiskey Jason, Jason at Malt Review, uh, Jason Julia. And um, I was smitten with him from the first time I met him. And you can understand why he's considered such a gent in the whiskey community. He's a fantastic guy. He's active in all sorts of social media channels. You've probably bumped into him at festivals if you've ever been to festivals up and down in the UK. He's, he occasionally... Uh, parades as a as a freelance brand ambassador and um, he runs a whiskey society and he's just generally an all-round uh, whiskey uh, personality and great guy to have around i'm going to introduce the gentleman that is andy ard baggy andy perslow how are you my friend hello hello everybody thanks roy for that intro that was very nice of you uh, i mean it how i'm very, very sincere about it um it's, it's been a pleasure to get to know you over the last couple of years. And you've been very supportive of me as well. And I want to say thank you for that too. You're very active in this community in the lounge and you're one of our most uh, prominent barflies. So it's a pleasure for me to welcome you on, my friend. I hope you're well. What are you sipping? Cheers. Uh, I've got an Ardbeg 10 at the moment, but uh, I've, I've brought in a, a, a special bottle just for tonight, which... I hope everybody can see that. Ardbeg Fischiel. Okay, that looks like a nice one. What is that one? Tell us what it is. So I'll read what it says on the label. So this is a very rare Ardbeg. It is drawn from two Spanish ex-Pedro Jimenez butts and bottled at Castran to celebrate the 2011 uh, Isla Festival of Music and Malt, the Fish Isle. This is a rare beast full of pent-up power. Don't turn your back on it. And it says all that on the label. That's, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open that now. That's the El Diablo bottling then that you're going to uncork tonight. This is, uh, this, is a a treat. This, is, this is where the isolation really, really frustrates because I, th this would be a, an amazing thing to enjoy with you. Roy Evans is asking me if my health is good. It is, Roy. He's saying it looks like I've got a sore eye tonight. Um, I think it's more likely to be the camera set up or something. Or maybe my, I am feeling very, very healthy. Um, I can, oh, my goodness. Look at the color of that. <laughs> that looks fantastic. How does it feel to so open that? Oh, really good, really good. And what I will do tonight, I will drop a question in if I can, and we'll share a couple of drams of that with the community uh, on a first come, first served basis. That's pretty amazing because that's a special whiskey for you to be able to share with us. I hope you've got a question prepared then, Andy, and I, and I welcome any of our hosts tonight to do the same thing. If they're interested in doing it, bring along your own question and we'll pick some people from the bar flies, from the, the lounge here. Um, and, uh, and get some dram sharing. That's a fantastic idea, my friend. Very generous. But I want to ask you, you're smitten with our beg, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yeah, I am. Tell us, tell um, us what I read. I read an article. Can I say that? I read an yeah. article on Malt Review, and I think it's maybe a couple of years ago you put it in now. And it was a very small, 2018, okay. A very small yeah. kind of human story. And it talked about you being there with your family. The distillery was closed. You took a bucket and a line down to the seaside. And all you wanted to do was catch some crabs. And you were caught in a moment. Let's talk us through. Tell yeah. us what happened. Uh, Roy Al 41, my friend. Evening, Roy. Hope you don't mind. Vicky Thompson uh, snuck me in through the ladies' room window <laughs> to Sunday's lock-in. Promise I didn't steal any rules. <laughs> okay, well, she takes responsibility for you, my friend. And uh, you're paying your dues now. Thank you very much, my friend. And uh, thank you for your dram. Cheers, my friend. Mm. Okay, so in... Uh, Go ahead, Andy. It was about 2003... Um, I went to Isla with the family, and uh, I think it was on the Saturday, the distillery was closed, and we took the crab line, and we just had a walk around and went to Ardbeg, walked down onto the, uh, by the pier there, and I sat down on the grass while the kids were uh, messing around in the water. It was crystal clear, and it was a lovely day. And I looked around and it was one of those moments you just look around, it was so peaceful. The water was like a mill pond. There was not a ripple, I kid you not. And 
he had one of those moments. I was like, my God, is this real? Is this place real? And and that really sort of started it for me. I just fell in love with the place um, and the people, obviously. And that's the people on Isla are just they're a special, special kind. And when you um, when you when you sit yeah. when you sip on our bag, then do you find yourself in, in a quiet moment? using the art bag almost to kind of transport you back almost to kind of take you to that spot in that moment yeah there's there's so many memories um of, of since since then when i've been at art uh yeah when when tasting it on your own sometimes or with friends and it takes you back to those special moments uh which will stay with you forever you're never gonna forget yeah. I tried to have a special moment with you in Fischiel 2018 when I was there with Bill. We turned up at our big day during the festival <laughs> and we, we were looking and it, we must have been going round like this looking for each other because we managed to get we managed to both attend our big day that year and not find each other. And of course, there's no signal at the best of times, but when you've got a few hundred people at our big, there's no chance of connecting by cell phone, right? Or mobile phone. Yeah. We did, we did walk around for, I think we missed missed each other by, we had to go rush off for the ferry about half past two. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. I stayed there for the, for the duration of the day. It was a great day. We had great weather that day. So, yeah. I mean, do you find that, I know that you're an Ardbeg collector. You've been collecting lots of Ardbeg. I mean, to have something like that, that, that uh, El Diablo 2011 bottling that you've just uncorked now, you must have been, you must have been somebody that's been in, I guess, since that moment in 2003. Yes, I've uh, uh, I've been there quite a few times, um, mostly for the festivals. Uh, but 2015, at their 200-year anniversary, was a real standout, um, standout occasion. Uh, the Ardbeg barbecue where uh, you you're encouraged to sort of bring a bottle so i took five <laughs> <laughs> and um i had a uh the 17 year old uh the lord of the isles uh, uh the 72 single cask 75 single cask um and um the beast and and uh, the 77 sorry and we just shared them out with everybody and they were just pulling bottles from everywhere and it was just everybody and everybody who was our big fan from uh, from off uh, from america and europe were there uh, which was really good really good to connect um, and all of those just one of those they all got yeah, opened all got opened they were all on they were all sealed when i took them did any survive yeah. Yes, I, I, I deliberately kept um, a third of each bottle back and brought them back down here to share with some of the guys down in Stourbridge in our Fantastic. society. Yeah. That's an amazing yeah. story, an amaz amazing sharing story. How do you feel about Ardbeg now, the modern Ardbeg? Because it's become so, so fashionable. It's almost like the McAllen of Isla, right? It's just... There's such a clamour for the product. You mentioned some crackers there. You mentioned the old 17-year-old that's long that's discontinued some single casks. And um, But the modern are big. Do you feel you can still connect with the modern whiskies that come from there? Yeah, I, I, I refer to the whisky in my article that I did for, uh, for malt. Um, and that uh, it is, it's, it's change everything is changing in the whiskey world everybody's chasing the old style yes um so now you you have to run i go with it you know some some uh, some of the bottlings aren't as good as previous bottlings um it doesn't matter to me it's just another expression of our bay that's a, that's, a nice, healthy, that's a nice healthy attitude you don't suffer from the nostalgia of all the old bottlings and when you used to be able to buy them much cheaper and things like that i guess you're quite happy to sit and make the most of the modern expressions as well i think it's a healthy attitude to have andy i really absolutely do. yeah absolutely. i'll just apologize to everyone if they see some dropouts i noticed a dropout happened on my side there 
Um, we've been getting warnings all day through StreamYard um, that the internet is struggling a wee bit with live streams in general, Facebook, YouTube, um, and it looks like uh, you might have to suffer hiccups now and again. Hopefully we stay clear and we stay with you. I've got a dram in front of me as well. I've got an art bag. I've got it in the blender's glass that was gifted to me by you, my friend. And I have to say, this glass is fantastic for bringing out aroma, right? It's fantastic for putting just a tablespoon of whiskey in the bottom. It's very small amounts, and it being able to just cap it off. I've got a little, I've got a little uh, glass topper here, and it really, really brings out the best in the in the in the aroma of the whiskey. But this is the, this is not nearly as classy as what you have, but it's about as classy as an Ardbeg as I have. And that's the the nineteen year old Trayvon. This is a, a release of from last year, forty six point two percent and nineteen years old from our bag, um, and uh, it's since become part of their core expressions. And it'll be an annual release, I believe. Have you tried it, Andy? Yes, yes, I've got a, a bottle. <laughs> yeah, I have it's to okay. say, it's good. The first half of this bottle. I felt it was flat and subtle and just so quiet. But I think I was comparing it to standard art bag. I had to stop and remind myself that I'm sipping a 19-year-old Isla whiskey where the smoke and the peat has had time to settle, become a bit quieter and a bit more integrated. And as, as the bottle's been open, I mean, tonight this is just, it's smelling to me like smoked honey. Yeah. Here is Dave is in. He's saying, love the glass topper. Is that new? <laughs> nice, Dave. It's just new. It's not new. It's not there yet. Billy Saunders is saying that bottling looks incredible that Andy has. It really, really does. Uh, do you get those glasses at B&Q? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I have to say that these are, um, I've only seen them for sale at the Whiskey Exchange shows. Uh, so I, I, I got mine at the Old and Rare, but I smashed it very fast. Uh, Andy was kind enough to send me this. And um, I was going to use it in a, an upcoming video uh, to talk about glassware. Um, but if you've only got a small amount of whiskey or if you've got something that's really precious that you only want to pour a small amount of, there's not a better glass, although it's difficult to drink from, right? I mean, I have to say, this this is a huge, huge yard bag. <laughs> this is like liquid tar, this is. <laughs> it just keeps going and going and going. You could chew this all night. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. What's the ABV? It is 55.1%. Uh, cast strength as well. Yeah. And what's the cast Don't. on it? It's two ex Pedro Jimenez. Okay, both PX. So you're getting a lot of that both really, PX. really kind of sweet syrupy sherry notes yeah but it's not overpowering it, the peat is holding its own with it it's it it is it is a great drum i'm jealous yeah. i'm slightly jealous come on then let's let's get this these drums shared let's uh let's go out to the community and see if anybody wants to throw a question in or, or okay then the, the question is mickey heads is retired Yes. He's, he's retired. So the question is, what year did he start at Ardbeg? What year did he replace Stuart Thompson? Yes. Yes. There you go. So the first person to answer, I don't know, I'm going to give it, I, I've got a good guess. I don't know exactly. Uh, ben Diedrich is in and he said uh, 17 years ago. I don't know. You're asking for the year. Uh, Rory Miller is saying 2003. Are you looking at the chat, Andy? Yeah. Oh, wow, look at the yeah, chat. Ma just let up. <laughs> Mark J. Goins, I think, was first. Mark Goins got it. 2007, I was going to say 2008. 2007, is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Mark Goins got it. Fantastic. He was 13 years. He was there. There you go. Mark Goins. Fantastic. Congratulations, Mark. You've got a dram of Ardbeg 2011 Fischiel, the El Diablo PX bottling, 55% and looking and sounding absolutely fantastic. Well, I don't know. Yeah, that's very generous of you, Andy. 
Very generous. Um, when do you think you're going to get next back to our big as soon as you possibly can? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you try to make so the show every year? or? Um, I wasn't planning on going this year because of going to Lindbergh. Which, yeah. as we all as we all know, is sadly we, we uh, all were. Yes, we were. Yeah, I was meant to go uh, in February, and I had to cancel um, for other other reasons. Um, but I hope when uh, everything gets back to normal, then yeah, I'm I'm due a visit. Well, I hope. Yeah, definitely. I hope that this time, if we're there together, we actually find each other, <laughs> and I'm sure we it will. Would be good. It would yeah. be good to get a, a barfly gathering on Isla. That would be something special. The way that things are going here, I think there's an inevitability about that. We just need to go over the immediate hurdles, don't we? And uh, yeah. I, it was looking like this year, the Fischiel this year, could have been like a mini barfly gathering there. Yeah, there was a few of us going over, courtesy of uh, uh, the, the doc spearheading that. Um it will happen. These things are only a matter of time, right? It's uh, where there's a will, there's a way. Interestingly Absolutely. about about Ardbeg and something I was considering recently is that um, in one of the old, the books I was reading, it talked about the size and the capacity of distilleries. About 100 years ago, back when Port Ellen was still in full swing and Loch and Dal over in Isla as well, that was still producing. Ardbeg was by far the biggest producer on the island. Absolutely. Yeah. What's interesting that's happened recently is that they've gone from kind of 1.2, 1.4 million as a capacity with their new extension. This year they'll be they'll be up at 2.4, 2.5 million liters. So they're becoming a big player again. It's very interesting times. It'll be interesting to see who takes over. I don't yes. think they've announced a new a new distillery manager yet. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> there's still going to be a demand. I mean, what's happened with Ardbeg is that back 100 years ago when it was the biggest on Isla, everything was going into a blend. There was a sliver yeah. of it being enjoyed as a single malt. But now everything is enjoyed as a single malt. Yeah. It's, it's completely... Old Ballantines. Old Ballantines has got Ardbeg in it. Is that was the smoky component in the Old Ballantines Ardbeg? Yeah. Yeah. And old Valentine's, you can still pick up at auction for a reasonable price. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Andy, it's Absolutely. fantastic to hang out with you. I've, it's been a pleasure for me. I hope everybody's been able to um, enjoy putting a face to the name. Um, and uh, hopefully you get some impression of just how cool a guy we have in front of us right now. But if you get a chance to hang out with him at any of the events in the future, You'll understand he's one of the most pleasurable guys to be sipping a dram alongside. It's a pleasure to have you on my show, my friend. It's a pleasure to have you as a friend. And uh, thank you so much for hosting us at Ardbeg. Thank you, Roy. Slant Cheers. Slant you. Ardbeggy. Ardbeggy, that's right. Ardbeggy. Our baggy is a, what is it they call that when they put, smash two words together? They call it a, like a portmanteau or something. Is that what a French word, portmanteau? I'm not good at French words, as you very well know. But it's a, our bag, of course, and baggy, our baggy. Baggy is the nickname for his football team, which is West Bromwich Albion. So he's known to everybody as our baggy. You can find him on Twitter. You can find him on Instagram. You can find him at whiskey festivals. You can find him in the lounge most weeks. He's a fantastic supporter of the channel and the community as well, and it's wonderful to have him. So here, I'm going to put a little lid on what I've got left of my tray van because potentially I'm getting through eight drams tonight. I have to be a wee bit careful of uh, how I'm getting on and what I'm sipping tonight. We are homeschooling. I have to be up and be fresh and powerful in the morning <laughs> to, to continue with the home homeschooling thing. And we're going to head along the road to... Um, uh, to Lefroig. Now it's currently owned by Centauri Beam Lefroig. It's been through various ownership over the years. Um, but as a brand, it's one of Isla's most recognizable. The famous stories about Lefroig is, of course, that this was prescribed as medicine through uh, the American prohibition of the 20s. 
Um, and if you see some really, really, really old bottles of Laphroaig, they've still get very much got this branding still intact. I have to say that it's got fans all across the world. It's one of these legendary distilleries. And I my, my current relationship with Laphroaig is one of... Um, uh, I find bottles that I really connect with and I really love. I was a fan of the Triple Wood, for example, which is strange for me because of it's not one I should be drawn to, but I loved it. I liked it a lot. Um, I loved the lore. I, uh, but I recently tried a few others, like the PX one that's a duty free and things like that, and felt that I wasn't connecting with it. I didn't. There wasn't any body there, and Lefroy should be big, bold, and heavy to me. Anyway, the two that I have with you tonight, this is always in the cabinet, Lefroy 10. Um, in the UK, unfortunately, it's out there at 40%, which is a wee bit of a disappointment, but like so many of our producers, uh, that the domestic product is out there at 40%. It's just something we have to suffer. But this is a much nicer presentation. This is their 16-year-old, which was originally an exclusive through Amazon across the UK and Europe. I believe it's going to make its way to further markets if it hasn't already. But this is at 48%, and that's a much nicer dram to pour. I actually have really enjoyed this. I think this is a good Laphroaig. Um, I don't think it's up there with their best, but it's not that expensive. So as I sip uh, a wee dram of Laphroaig, we don't have a host there tonight, but I can jump in and uh, use our sharing of Laphroaig and our wee stop in the lay-by to hang out with you guys. Daniel Vermas is saying the 48% Laphroaigs are better ones over the others. So the 48% Laphroaigs, he's talking about things like the quarter cask, which is a non-age statement. Um, refill, uh, obviously quarter cask, um, American oak. But I have to say a very good Laphroaig and a very affordable Laphroaig. 48% um, presentation as well helps it a lot, same as this one here. And I have to agree with you, Daniel, especially for the enthusiast that's looking for a bit of grip and a bit more texture there, a bit more bite to the dram. The quarter cast brings it where there's the 10 always parades as soft peat. But the 10 works very, very well to people who are new to whiskey and haven't got over the ABV barrier yet. This is slightly more kind of fruity than the Ardberg. The Ardberg was a drier prospect. It was more kind of uh, that the the kind of ash note was there. That was the smoked honey is what I was picking up from that tonight. This is much more kind of white fruit and honeydew melon and this is still fairly peaty. And this is coming from somebody who doesn't often uh, or who often nowadays doesn't or struggles to pick up the peat. It's very easy for me to cancel out the peat on drums this, this weather. That's a full, nicely round, nice grip, nice texture, nice space mid palette. It's rounded, it's much more bold than that our bag I've just been sipping. White fruit is there, a little bit of citrus. This, this sits nicely. This, this bottle's been open for a little while as well. It sits nicely. It's a very enjoyable Laphroaig. It's mature. I have to say this is quite a good one. This is quite a good one, and it wasn't that expensive. Spiritworks Tom is in East St. Aquavita evening and all. I'm a bit late to the party, but I've lined up some Lagavulin 12, Laphroaig 15, Arbeg Supernova, Laddie Blackheart 6.1, Kilholman Port Cask, and a GM 2003 Kalila. Tom, I don't expect anything less, but you're not messing about. You've lined up a tasting for a lord tonight, a lord of the isles. Fantastic, Tom. Nice to welcome you in, my friend, and don't worry at all about being a wee bit late. Um, so we're going to leave our Laphroaig in the glass. I'm going to have another wee one more sip. I was enjoying that. And we'll head a wee bit along the Kildalton coast to one of my favourites. I mean... <laughs> It's no news there for people that have been joining in for a long time, but we're going to be heading along to Lagavulin. And uh, Lagavulin is singularly responsible, not just for the being the whiskey that switched me on to being like a super obsessed whiskey enthusiast, um, but it was also the whiskey that got me enjoying the peated style, the smoky style. 
I, I was drinking it, but I wasn't really connecting with it. I was struggling with it a little bit when I first got into whiskey. And the first four or five years of, of my whiskey journey was kind of spent avoiding smoke and peat. And then my brother and I had an experience with Lagavulle in 16 and my world changed. And I often talk about that moment being singularly responsible for my life traje trajectory, certainly in whiskey. Um, it's always been a soft spot for me. But a friend of mine from Germany, another member of the community and the guy who's going to be our host tonight at Lagavulin, has similar passions for the place. But I want to ask him why. This guy's been a supporter of the channel for a long time. I've been in his company many times. He's hosted me in Germany on a couple of occasions and he's an absolute pleasure to hang around with. We're of course talking about uh, my friend, the doc, McAllen Fine and Rare. Welcome, my friend. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm very, very well. And it's really Hello, everybody. nice to see you. And it's <laughs> nice to see you flying the colours as well. Yes. You're such sure. a star. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're looking very well. And I know I've been in that exact spot that you're sitting in right now. So I, I'm imagining that uh, we have the, the, the laptop or the webcam the, sitting on your pool table, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know exactly what's going on here. And some of, some of the folks as well uh, in the chat today. So like Rolfi is in, uh, probably Savvy, Arrow. They've all been here and they've all been taking benefit from what's back there. <laughs> yes. You have but some also adding to it, uh, I should also mention, and thanks again at this point, for example, this Telesca 8 up here. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Getting confused. That was a present from, from you guys. So thanks, thanks very much for that. You're well really low over there. <laughs> We've all experienced uh, the McAllen Fine and Rare, the docks hospitality, and enjoyed it very, very much in that in that room. It's a pleasure. This is the first time I've had you on the show, and I always threatened that I would right. find an excuse to get you on. We tried to have you on in the blind challenge in December, but shipping yes. things foiled that. <laughs> it's nice to welcome you to talk about one of your favorite distilleries and certainly your favorite on Isla. I just want to mention Jonathan Flowers is in and saying it's eerie how similar our whiskey journeys are. I thought I never knew whiskey could be so complex when I first tried Lagavulin in 16. Grabbed the Lagavulin 8 and 16 for tonight. Good for you, Jonathan. Good to see you in as well, my friend. Kevin Bryant. Thanks for the off. bridge. <laughs> oh, yeah. What fantastic you that scene you have there. That's a 2008, uh, so distilled in 1991 or 1992, something like that. Uh, an older one. Still very, very nice. Finished Kim by. Is saying, <laughs> we'll, we'll never forget watching the seals from the end of the pier at Lagavulin walk from Laphroaig and having a dram along the way. Magical. Yeah. Tell us, Doc, what? how did Lagavulin bite you? Yeah, it started in the year 1996 uh, with this, uh, obviously not this bottle, but... but the 1996. Lagavulin. 1996, yes. When um, you were 26 just, then? Uh, I was actually 26, <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> uh, I just finished my PhD in, in the year before and started a new job uh, about 300 kilometers from where I live, which is in the Frankfurt area. And... Um, uh, I got to know a friend uh, at, uh, I made friends with a guy from my company uh, and he invited me to his house one night uh, and he poured uh, Lagavulin 16 and I drank it and I, it was, yeah, I mean, I think we all know these epiphany moments. It was just, you can't describe what it was. It was just amazing. And what was most amazing to me was this, uh, the finish. Uh, and what happened was uh, it, it faded away to some extent, uh, especially the smokiness. And then seriously and reproducibly, about a minute later, it came back. So it's, it was just something I have never experienced and I'm always chasing for. So I love these long finishes that, that change flavor profiles in, 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 in time. And this was just so amazing and absolutely unforgettable. And uh, I was hooked and since then, I mean, obviously, I was then in, in the U.S. for a while and in China and in different locations and so forth. Uh, but um, I started my collection then. It was little then, has increased <laughs> to some extent. But, um, yeah, I actually uh, continued after my return from, from the U.S., which was 2008. And from then on, I started collecting lots of Lagavulins. And that actually leads me. And by the way, um, what I'm sipping right now, 
stories yeah. stories like that stories like that make the hairs on my neck stand on end because i i relate so so completely with everything that you're talking mm -hmm. about and it, it's a very real thing and when people are not enjoying whiskey the way we are or have been it can be difficult they think you're a little bit mad they think you're a little bit crazy when you talk about that and that's the kind of people that i like to work with and work on and some might say even bully until i get them to the point that if you can witness that in somebody else's face and vicariously live that moment again yeah it, it's almost just as pleasurable but what the, what you talked about when it comes back a minute later or sometime later that's what we often refer to as the peat repeat <laughs> repeat repeat i never heard that expression no that's good to know sometimes it happens the next morning <laughs> <laughs> this i know <laughs> but yes, i didn't, didn't have a word for it i have an idea i hope this can okay look what i found i should i wish i'd brought through a lagavulin 16 but i didn't i've got a couple of lagavulins here um but the one i'm going to pour is actually the eight-year-old um nice. this is the newer version of the eight-year-old but i'm going to pour it in this glass do you recognize this oh yeah the german Rastal glass <laughs> this is the german glencairn right yes the german response to glencairn i like to call it <laughs> I'm only going to pour a little dram and I'm going to raise a glass to our uh, Lagavulin epiphanies. Cheers, my friend. Slanderoy. What's in your glass? And everybody. Uh, the Caden hats that I just showed you, the nine year old, it's, it's officially a Kill Dawn Tone distillery. So, uh, but I would bet my house uh, that it is a Lagavulin and it's actually known to the community that it is a Lagavulin. Yes, and but often these obviously bourbon cask as usual. I mean, we can we can very we can speak in whis whispers when we discover what's in uh, an undisclosed bottling, but it's it's really important to the bottler that um, it's not seen that the word is getting out there because it makes it difficult for them to source further product. I think if they if they let it out, whose distillery they're bottling, oftentimes. But Slanche Doc, it's lovely to have you here, my friend. Mm, 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 mm. Totally different from the drums I've just had. That sweet, sweet creaminess is there, right? It's creamy and sweet. There's licks of candy floss and icing sugar in there. There's that briny seaweed me medicinal thing is happening. And this is why it's these things. This is why we love peated whiskey. Because it's, yes, the, the peat is, I, I hate it when peated whiskey gets spoken about in a way that all they need to do is provide a peaty experience and the job is done. It's not true. That's enough for a lot of people, just a big peat hit. But when it can bring layers and complexity, when you can sit with it for an hour and still be discovering new uh, nuances and, and flavors and aromas, all of the Isla distilleries are capable of doing that. And uh, for me, <laughs> and I think for you as well, none more so than Lagavulin at times. That actually leads me to my second epiphany. Oh, that is linked to this beauty, the 2017 Lagavulin 12 cast strength. Well, we, we both, I'm sure Thank we know how, how I feel about this one. Tell us yes, about a this. Lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people talked about that. And that was actually the, the background. So I, I bought a bottle in sometimes, I'm not sure, like December 2017. And uh, while you were running uh, the Ralphie VPUB on the 100K subscribers, in, I think it was the 21st of January in 2018, okay. I, had opened, I had opened the bottle and I poured my dram. And I poured, I think, another four drams <laughs> of this in the course of the two and a half hours. And I just was blown away by it and and the very next uh, actually on that day in fact it was the next day because it was already past midnight i ordered 13 bottles of it right away Thir 13 bottles 13, yes my biggest order i ever placed not in terms of money but in terms of number of bottles and uh and, and yeah, why, is that just some. to ensure that you could continue to have that same epiphany moment in, into the future or basically yes so i want to retire with this moment and, and, and you know maybe share it with friends who have kind of run out of the 2000 absolutely. <laughs> absolutely i still have a bottle here i still have a fully intact happy to do that. Bottle here. happy to do that 
I'm I'm just kidding you, but but uh, yeah, I know where to come if I do run out of that one too. Yep. You know, so that's interesting. So that that happened to you while you were watching. Um, no, so that isn't the show that Ralphie joined. That is just the show that I did as a kind of tribute to Ralphie. Yep. Well, Toro was on, and and um, uh, who else? Vin Scott was on. Oh, well. Welsh Toro. Scott, yep. Yeah, um, I'm yeah. trying to remember. Not Ralphie himself. Yeah, we we had a we had a bunch of people on just to talk about how um, Ralphie had had potentially um, influenced and led us and helped us yes. in some way. Fantastic, yeah. and I, and I know that Ralphie does from time to time enjoy a wee Lagavulin himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's Not fabulous stuff. How many times have you been there and visited it for, you, for yourself? Uh, Isla just twice so far, but uh, as you know, I think a lot of people know. I have heard about my distillery tours, <laughs> uh, 41 in 10 days, no problem. Again, I'm not talking in Speyside, but I'm talking Annandale to Highland Park and, uh, you know, all over the place. So that was my, my record. Um, but Isla, I've only been twice so far. For, for people that haven't picked up already, we'll come to understand that, that the doc doesn't do things by halves. <laughs> when he has an epiphany with a bottle, he phones up and orders 13 of them. <laughs> <laughs> and when he comes over to Scotland to visit right. distilleries, he manages to put together a very Germanic, disciplined, super efficient <laughs> agenda in order to That's strike true. 41 in one trip, which has got That's to be true. some kind of record. Probably. My friend, it's so wonderful to be able to welcome you on here. And it's so wonderful to let everybody see your happy, kind face. And it's great for me to be able to thank you on a show for all your support over the years for your wonderful hospitality that you've shown us in Germany and for the yeah. nice times that we've had as you've hung out in Scotland with us together as well. I'm very Thank glad you. that we have um, lots of Lagavulin synergy too to talk about long into the future. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Take care. Good night. You too. Bye -bye. Stay around. Sure. The Doc. The doc and his uh, love for Lagavulin. I have to say, those epiphany stories are kind of my favourite thing to talk about because we all relate to them. We all understand exactly what that's about. Chris Mira is saying, "Who drove on that ten-day trip, McAllen Fine and Rare?" <laughs> well, I think it was. I think it was actually him. Uh, Multi-mission men were saying, "Well, obviously, who would order six and a half bottles of whiskey? He doesn't do things by half." Menno, you're obviously feeling very healthy and you're back to your super sharp self, but you're absolutely right. He doesn't do things by half. Okay, so from here, um, we're down at Port Ellen still. And uh, there are various building projects happening at Port Ellen. Uh, the one that everybody's most excited about, the one that I'm actually excited about and very curious to see how it develops is the uh, rebirth of Port Ellen. Port Ellen is currently a maltings facility that's going to remain but they are bringing back the Port Ellen distillery on Isla, which is, um, frankly, I know that a lot of people have been a little bit cynical about that, but what's the alternative? That they go and open a greenfield site or something? No, they have to revive Port Ellen if the money and the appetite and the, the, the desire is there to do that. We'll pass uh, a couple of work in progress, building sites, planning permission stages at Gartbrek and uh, Sukinder Singh's a project at Farkin as well, both within um, the vicinity of Port Ellen. But we're going to head up the strand. We're going to head up to uh, the heart of the island now and leave Port Ellen and arrive at Bamore, which is kind of the island's capital with that kind of round circular church at the top of the street there, very, very iconic images. And the distillery has got to be one of Isla's greatest legends sitting in Bamore, obviously Bamore Distillery itself. Warehouse number one there, partially said to be under sea level, is one of the most um, legendary warehouses and said to be the oldest in a Scotch whiskey maturation as things currently stand. So with this legendary status, there are whiskies littered throughout Bamore's history that are just beyond spectacular. I have tried very, very few. I've been very lucky and been in environments where I've been able to just ever so slightly for just one or two drams touch on the magnificence uh, that Bamore has reached in its history. But I have to say, this comes as a bit of a confession, but it's quite telling. I 
don't have any more here. And and that's astonishing to me. I've had the 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 Bamor uh the 12, I've had the 15, I've had the 18, I've had uh, various non-age statement Bamors, I've had independent bottlings of Bamor, and I have yet to have a Bamor that I've wanted to replace. Now, there was a time about 10, maybe more years ago, um, maybe not as, as much as 10 years ago, actually, that I was very much enjoying Bamor. But either it changed or I changed, but whatever way around it happened, it happened way too quickly. And I am still at a point where I do find great Bamors, really enjoyable Bamors. But I, I struggle to invest in it. And I wonder what that is. I think it's probably me. Spiritworks Tom is saying no Bamor here either. That's interesting. I guess that the only comments we're going to get now is people that agree. But if, if you do, if you're a Bomor fan, please shout out. Um, Chris Mir is saying, did you try the 17 White Sands? Uh, that I think the 17 White Sands, was that not a, that was a travel retail one, if I remember right? I'm not sure. Um, I don't have any memory of trying it, Chris Mir. Our baggy is saying, I had a moment at Bomor in 2013, and he uh, uh, would it be Eddie? Was, his surname isn't McCaff, it's oh, McCaffrey or MacArthur. Um, turning the barley and the maltings. Oh my! Well, I was actually I got wonderful hospitality at Bamor. It was an amazing experience. We were staying in the cottages there. We got to light the kiln. We got to turn the barley. We got to do lots of hands-on stuff, and it really, really gave me a, a, a strong bond and affinity with the place to touch it and experience it at that depth. And there are fantastic Bamors to connect with out there, but I struggle to find them. And I think that it only takes two or three bottles for you to kind of go, oh, well, that was kind of, uh, that was just okay. And then you suddenly find yourself not willing to gamble or invest or explore further. And there's so much choice out there that it makes it difficult. Pete had to say the Fashil bottle of last year was wonderful. If you could have got a hold of it, did you hear about the queues in the courtyard at Fischiel last year for the Bamor stuff? Neil Cochran is saying some great independent Bamors. I agree fully. And uh, Andreas Service Alafis is saying modern official bottling Bamor is really dull. Independent bottlings, on the other hand. So I think we're, we're, we're picking up the theme here. Um, Karsten Radan is upset. He's saying they should never have discontinued Bamor 15 Lamrick. Now, the Lamrick is... is um, that might just be that they, they they don't always want to discontinue things. Sometimes they just don't have the depth of stock, which could have been the case for that 15-year-old. But that's interesting. You were obviously a fan of that. Jay Francis is saying, really enjoyed the Bamore 15. Only had a few drams of it, though, at bars. Um, that's the 15 darkest, I imagine, then, Jay. Uh, I think even the 15 darkest is bottled at 40%, which in the UK, the Bomor 12 is bottled at 40%. And you just feel, oh, the way it's vatted, the way it's potentially heavily, heavily coloured, the way it's presented is just so old fashioned for an enthusiast and for an enthusiast's perspective I'm talking about. I have the taste of that list, the Lagavulin on, on my palate and it's absolutely gorgeous. Sweet, delicious, peat. Orange Willis saying, I was meant to be at Bamor on my 50th birthday in a few months' time. You and I both, my friend, May Fischiel, for me, it's it's uh, not cancelled, it's delayed, it's merely postponed. And I hope it's the same for you, my friend. Eric Evanson is saying, have you tried the 15 or any older versions? Being able to try some really, really fantastic old Bamors, things to make your eyes roll into the back of your head but they're not easily purchased. The Whiskey Drama is saying, really enjoyed the Bamor Tempest in their tasting room overlooking the loch. Ah, well, that's going to make it, right? I, t I have to say, visiting and touring Bamor, it's it's a very good... I would say Bamor and Laphroaig could arguably have the best standard tours. Um, very, very good tours. Um, you get to see the working kiln. You get to touch the barley on the malting floor. You get um, the sense of, of uh, I mean, Kilholman has malting now as well, but at Bamor um, and at Laphroaig, you, you get the sense of 
the history there and just the, you know hundreds of years of of producing spirit on site and you can really be in a moment and then uh lafroig and, and looking out over the bay is fantastic when you go to Bamor, they've got this glass window so even when the weather you almost want the weather to be challenging and really violent and and you know driving rain strong winds throwing the waves up onto the bay there and the, the stony beach at Bamor, so that you can stay inside at the bar with the glass windows that they have there and just look out over Loch and Dal and just have a moment <laughs> it's I know it sounds like I'm over-egging it, but I'm serious. It's a real thing. McAllen Fine and Rare is saying we had some great old Bamores during Inter Whiskey 2018, to be fair. Grand masterclass. I did participate in that. They were stunning Bamores. Um, and I have to say that a lot of people not only... They, they talk about Bamores coming back, and, and they, they talk about the seven-year-old, the eight-year-old, the nine-year-olds, those kind of Bamores that we're seeing, mostly through independence, I have to say. And said that you know it's so good that Bamor's going to come back and it's going to come back with a vengeance. Well, okay, you can have the really good product there, but it's how it's handled, it's how it makes its way from that cask. And because I don't doubt Bamor's ability to make fantastic whiskey as a distillery, but it, but it, it's how I think we as enthusiasts care a lot now about how it makes its way from the cask to the shelf. Um, a lot is lost depending on the intended market, I guess. And McCallum Fine and Rare points out, but each bottle was 800 euros. Absolutely. So where do we go from Bamor? Well, we're up in the heart of Isla now. So what we're going to do is take a drive around the top of Loch and Dal, and we're going to pull over to a revived distillery. Now, it's been revived for 20 years already. Um, but it's, it's sometimes um, we have to remind ourselves that Brook Laddie was a lost cause at one point but it's very much back alive now. And there's a guy out there that I know I'm very privileged to call my friend, like, like everybody that's participating tonight, honestly, like so many of you guys in the crowd. Um, but I've managed to meet and hang out with a Ben, Ben Diedrich from uh, Single Malt Alliance on Instagram. And he's also a brand ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. He's one of the kindest, most generous, and most thoughtful souls that you'll ever happen across. He's also one of Whiskey's poster boys, um, but I'm very, very privileged to call him a friend. I'm hoping that I'm getting him blushing and shaking his head a wee bit. Ben, how are you? Hey, Ryan, how are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. It's just, you know, putting myself on a poster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know how I have to, to say, I have to say, you're a very, very considerate, thoughtful pair. And I have to, f whiskey generally is full of kind people. And I don't know if it attracts kind people or if whiskey itself is just very good at bringing the best out in us. I think, interesting it, uh, pose, right? I, mean, I think whiskey attracts a certain type of person, but then again, we're all so different in our own ways. And there's so many different walks of life connected. So perhaps it is the latter that whiskey does bring the best out of us. Um, I, I, or perhaps it's just a mutual respect that we have for each other, you know, because we have so much passion for the spirit to begin with. And if you have the passion, you know, naturally you are my friend. I think it's all the above maybe, but I, I was really, you know, walking into this really crowded pub and I had my cool with me and then you called me a poster boy. I'm off my game now. So forgive me. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. And I don't apologize for making you blush whatsoever. Not at all. Okay. You have a fantastically handsome backdrop there as well. You're very on brand with SMWS tonight. But yeah, I can you know, see why it looks amazing. Yeah, this is my office, which is not too far from my home. Uh, it's the first time I've been here in over two weeks now, and so I've been quarantined at home just as a precaution, you know, with the virus. And uh, oh wow, yeah, I was, I was able to get in the building, you know, not touching anything, just using my feet and kicking the door and uh, scanning my pass. So it's. Washing your hands as soon as you arrive, and <laughs> so exactly uh, between the hand sanitizer and the whiskey, I don't know what is what, quite frankly. So, uh, yes, sour notes off of this. I don't know. I'm finding my hands because I have the amount of time. And what is my skin on my hands are just so dry. I just washing, yeah. washing all the time. That's that's as much as we're going to refer to the current times, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we're in a bubble. But thanks for joining us. I appreciate that it's a wee bit earlier over yeah. where you are as well. But it was easy for me to consider that you would be the perfect host to receive us at Brook Laddie. 
Yeah. What what is it? What what let's I tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do an uncorking while you while you share your story. Yeah. But I think you've got a sample of this. Um I bought this when I when I made the magic of Isla video, you'll see my friend Bill sipping this and having a moment with it on that video. Yeah. Uh, I, I had the same experience with this. I love this. It's a 2008 beer barley at 50% from Brook Laddie. Um I haven't tried it since that trip, and this is a sealed bottle, but it's getting opened tonight. And while I open it, tell me what Brookladdy's a Marmite distillery. There are people who absolutely adore it and they love it and they love the the lengths that they go to 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 explain what's in the bottles. And um and there are people out there who just don't connect with it. Yeah. Tell me what, what's what's made you connect? Just a point on that. I think that's with a lot of us, with a lot of our own interests as whiskey enthusiasts, you know, no one distilleries for anyone. So, I, you know, I, I when someone says they don't like Brooklady, for instance, I couldn't care less. You know, I implore them to go find one, seek out what they enjoy. But you know, for me personally, it's it's a bit like asking, you know, why did you marry your partner? It's there's no one reason. I, I think early on, maybe it was 10 years ago, you know, the distillery, as you mentioned, was revived 20 years ago. And it's, it's interesting because the way I see it, there's sort of the old era, the spirit, and then the new era. And to me, the output is very different. You know, the, the whiskey in terms of the approach to distillation and overall cast management is, is very different. So the, and that carries on the flavor. So I look at Brooklyn almost today as two different distilleries when it comes to enjoying the whiskey that's been put out over the years. Um, but I, I fell for actually the, the, the new era about 10 years ago. I liked the younger spirits. And I don't think, when I first tasted, I'm trying to think, of, I can't remember the first Brooklady whiskey I tried. I just, it was different to me. And I later learned that the difference was directly related to the, the quality of the spirit. And I think as I became more educated, I, I realized, oh, this is what happens when you use high quality casks. This is what happens when you're a bit more selective with your grain. And, and that all carried forward. So, so I think in, in naturally I, I enjoyed the flavor. It was unique to me. And I'm I'm blanking you know all of these whiskeys from the distillery into one, but then as I became more familiar with the distillery and what they're doing from a technical level, I really came to appreciate just the spirit, and then as well as the distillery's approach to just really I don't know giving back to Isla and representing Isla, a land that's so foreign to me. But as a whiskey enthusiast, I can appreciate and having been there, just seeing the people rally around it. And, you know, it's interesting because, so I enjoy the whiskey. I love the, the, I think the diversity of what they offer is unlike any other Isla distillery. You have the unpeated laddie expressions, as they call it, the core brick laddie. You yeah. have the Charlotte, which is, you know, the medium peat, but really it's a heavily peated spirit. And then you have the Octomore, which is the extremely heavily peated. And within that, the diversity of casks that are used, wine casks, a lot of bourbon barrels, it's unlike any other. So for me, if I, if I were to just choose one distillery, that I could only drink from for the rest of my life, it would be Brooklady just because I would the like diversity. Yeah. But yeah. I think it was really it's interesting because I my first trip there was only hours after we were at uh what was the pub in the Glasgow that we were at? I forgot. My first trip that you and I were together two years ago. Uh, uh well, that was Glen, we went to Glen Goyne. We were yeah, we were at the pot still late. We were it was a late night. I was up till about two in the morning. Ah, yes, yes. We went to we went to a couple of bars, I think. We ended up at the pot still. Um, and uh we were down in Finiston as well at the Ben Nevis. Would that be right? We we went there and then we, anyway, it was a yeah. good night and it was a late night. And a few hours later I had to wake up in the morning and I you know went to Brooklady about ten in the morning. And it's interesting because as as an fan of the distillery and what they do for years. I would, obviously, I was nervous to go. I was excited. But when I went there, it, it sort of took this online dating relationship, you know, and kicked it up into, into the real life. And I, and I really found that my experience there was authentic. It was completely consistent with, you know, the marketing. And look, whiskey marketing, is, as we all know, <laughs> is its own little entity at times. And so I, I thought everything was consistent. It was genuine, authentic. Uh, my host there was fantastic and she really just spent more time talking about Isla than she did the distillery. And at the time I was thinking, well, this is crazy. I want to see. Can I, can I pause? And I don't know the answer to this. Could it be Lindy? I'm sorry. Was it Lindy? No, it wasn't. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. It's just when you started to talk about how much she was talking about island things. Sorry, Ben, continue. No, I, I think that just reinforces, I think everyone at the distillery is really, really into their home of Isla. Um, and a lot, a lot was, a lot of time was spent educating me on Isla, the people, the culture, what it means uh, to produce whiskey in Isla. And so it, anyway, it felt authentic. Perhaps that was intended for me to come on a show like this and join the pub and talk about it and evangelize the brand. But uh, it worked for me. And I, I've just loved the spirit ever since. Absolutely. And, and I think that uh, you make a good point about, um, I, I think Brooke Laddie was in a, a kind of uh, holding pattern slash panic mode before it closed. And there was very, very, um, let's see, volatile releases or volatile product put into perhaps not the best of casks. Mm -hmm. And I know that when it was when it was brought back to life again, while they were waiting for their spirit to mature, their careful spirit to mature, um, they had to make the best of what they had. And there was a lot of uh, recasking went on. There was a lot of inventive bottlings and things. And it got it got very, very confusing for a while. And I think that now that there's a style coming out of Brook Laddie that we can start to recognize as their base style, and from that, all their inventiveness, all their uh, variation, and all the diversity that you're talking about stems. I I have become a fan, actually, of, of Brook Laddie, but I find that like a lot of distilleries out there, they seem to have found their stride in recent years. And it's become much more reliable a product than it perhaps was in recent history. I don't know if you would agree. Yeah, I think it's it's evolved quite a bit. Uh, you know, with the acquisition by what Remy Control that, that changed things. You know, Jim McEwen, who was a head distiller, uh, who, who kicked off the resurrection at the time, and is now has been replaced by after retirement. Well, temporary retirement has been re replaced by Adam Hannett. And I think the two distillers have perhaps I would argue you know. As head distillers, they have more freedom, perhaps, than others do. You know, a lot of times, as distillery managers, you don't have the sort of flexibility to create as sort of an artist would, if you will. But I think Jim McEwen had a, a fair amount of freedom in that sense. I think Adam does, too. And so they're two different styles. But I did enjoy the young innocence of the early 2000s spirit that really was put off of the first decade, uh, which has evolved since then, too, in good and bad ways. Yeah. Yeah, I've just had a wee sip of this uh, beer barley, and uh, I, <clears throat> so this is a beer barley is is a, a very inefficient, difficult to grow, difficult to get any yield from, very awkward to handle uh, strain of barley, um, and I, I don't know how much of that is in this glass right now, but this is a fabulous. Fabulous drama of whiskey. What did you pour, Ben? Yeah, so I poured the beer barley as well. And just because I am that guy, I also poured the Isla Barley, the, the most recent release. Nice. This is actually the first time I, I've done it side by side. So this the, the beer barley is made from 100% beer barley grown in Orkney. So it's an island, an island switch. And then this, is, of course, is Isla Barley. And I'm familiar with this one. It's become my go-to whiskey for just a ca for casual drinking. But so the beer so the, which beer barley are you drinking then? Yeah, this is the same one. This was actually a sample that I had. This is a the 2008, which I believe. Oh is wow! It. Okay, so the 2008 that I have is is Isla Barley. What's the one that you just showed right there? What is that? Isla beer barley. Um, is oh, interesting. Oh, you know what? I, I was incorrect. It actually tells you the estate. It's the Dunlosset estate. It might show up better on the bottle here. Yeah. Um, this is the same one, actually. Yeah. So it's Isla Grown, beer bar, but interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So but, but I think you're absolutely right. There's some of the, I mean, let's be honest, barley, growing barley on Isla is 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 a crazy man's passion because um, it's it, the weather there is so, so volatile. It's brutal. It's not... It's not easy to find sheltered fields to make a good crop of barley, but they also shelter thousands and thousands and thousands of crop-eating birds, flocks of geese, and, and they can just decimate crops depending on the timing and things. And, and it's, they struggle to grow lots of, of barley on it. And I know that Brook, Brook Laddie have regular Isla Barley releases, um, and this beer barley that we are enjoying right now was grown on Isla, but I know that... Many of the other expressions obviously must not must be sourced elsewhere. 
It's interesting because I was just looking, you know, at Master Malt, for instance, it says right, right on the product page, harvested on Orkney. Here on the sample, you're right, it says Isla grown. So as we, maybe previous releases has been Orkney and it's maybe been a copy yeah. and paste by the boys at Master Malt or something. But um, yeah. but I mean, it, it made me think that perhaps your sample and, and my bottle could have been a different product. It could have been uh, different. And such is the activity at Brook Laddie. I have to say, it's one of the things that I celebrate uh, when Remy Quantro took over. We were always a wee bit nervous about what would happen, how much it would change, would would they, where would they take it? But they've they've encouraged more of the same, and in fact, they've actively um, invested more in the same ethos and philosophy. It's quite encouraging from from my perspective. I don't know if you would echo that. Yeah, and I, and I listened to a podcast. You know, when Jim McEwen was still distilling at, at Brooklady shortly after the, the acquisition. And he was just saying, and he was asked what cha- what has changed. And his response was, well, when something breaks, it's fixed within a week. We don't have to sit around for three months and wait for you know, a, a new part. Uh, we, we have the funds and the cash flow to now go get a replacement part and, and resume operations right away. And that, that was his response. And perhaps things have changed since then more and more, but as the brand has grown, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. And it's nice when you have these kind of positive stories that happen. I mean, I know that uh, when Burn Stewart was acquired by Distel, everybody was nervous. That seemed to have done very, very well over those three distilleries. And that there is this idea that that um, people are starting to understand that whiskey is not all about bulk production and efficiency anymore. They're understanding that there's a real, real uh, value to be had and a good quality, well presented product afterwards, and they, but uh, Brook Laddie have to be applauded that all the releases go out at decent ABV, fifty percent, and they all go out at very good and natural presentation. Um, and you can discover right down to the cask, I believe, what's in your bottle if you so desire. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, I think we had a little bit of a experience just deciphering the origin of the barley, so <laughs> I think it's possible to figure it out. It, yeah. Yeah, but I think there's a code on the bottles. Yeah, yeah, let me, you can plug into the website, um, and you can you can discover much much more. I mean, down to geek level detail. Yeah, which is which is super interesting to do from time to time. I appreciate that the information's there if if you want to seek it out. You know, the it, doesn't non- need, it doesn't need to. They don't need to lead with it, right? Yeah, it, it can just be behind there for the people who want to dig and the people that are really. Uh, and passionate in that way. Uh, this is, I, I don't know if you want to do some tasting notes here, but I have to say there's a couple of things happening here that I'm really excited about. I've just come on off the back of three heavily peated whiskies. I've had a, a, an Arbeg, a Lefroig, a Lagavulin, and I'm sipping this unpeated beer barley from a neck pour that's just been uncorked tonight, and it's very flavorful. It's very, very rich and flavorful. I'm uh, having a moment here. I have to figure out which is which. <laughs> <laughs> they are, so they're, they're very different. I mean, if everybody else at the pub who's had the Isle of Barley, it, it, it is different. And we've just realized this is, in fact, beer barley grown in Isla. So both both are, but very, very different. Let's try and lead each other with some notes here a wee second. Mm-hmm. I'm actually getting gorgeous milk chocolate, perhaps even white chocolate from it. Yep. I would I would say that there's a lovely little kind of delicate soft spice, like a very very light ginger. There's a slight uh, milkiness, almost dairy like uh, nuance to it as well. Um, but it's but it's it's rich. And one of the things one of the things I was hoping I was going to experience from this, and it is there, is the texture. It's nice and oily. Yeah, I love that. The texture carries through. I get the ginger, a hint of dried gin- ginger, but I get a bit, a bit like a chocolate frosting, as we would say. Is this frosting a, a term you'd use in the UK as well? I mean, like a cake. Oh, uh, icing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chocolate icing, icing, yeah. Right. It's like a milk chocolate icing. It, it has sort of this confectionery sugar note. It's really sort of astringent in the nose. Yeah. But so I'm right. exactly leading each other nicely. Lead me some more. Are you getting any fruit? It's more, more than fruity for me, and I get a bit of a malt barn characteristic. It's not, it's not sort of the wild maritime notes of, the, and it's tough because I was just going back and forth with the Isle of Barley. The Isle of Barley has more of the brine, um, sort of coastal notes. So this is more of a, sort of a farm, if, if you will. Yeah, but, 
it's all balanced to me, which which I appreciate. It's no, no one thing is jumping out at you. It is overall a very complex orchestral experience, which is what I appreciate about appreciate about this one. I have to say also as well. I mean, it's kind of medium finish. It's not particularly long, but it's Moorish. It does after you've sipped it, after you're enjoying it, and it does make you want to go back a wee bit. And wow. here we are. Yeah, it's very yep. nice. It's very nice. So there you go. I, I knew you were a fan. I knew you. And and tell me, does SMWS, did, did they get a chance to, to bottle much Brook Gladdy? You know, I'm sure there are a few casks left kicking around the warehouse. So there are thousands, there are maybe 13,000 casks in stock right now. But um, since Remy took over, I believe they've discontinued their, their ca private cask program. You know, I yes. know Brook Gladdy was, was offering casks yep. to retailers and yes. shops. Um, so SMWS in the, in the past has put out some fantastic, fantastic examples of say Port Charlotte, you know, but we had, we had, we had one last year, uh, a Brooklady. Obviously we don't disclose it's Brooklady. It's, it's coded out, but uh, I'm hoping there are more and more tucked away that we can get at. But in addition to that, at least Brooklady does offer their own single cast program and they have some fantastic whiskeys if you can get them. I have to say the best Brook Gladdy that I have here is a private cask. It's a, a refill Oloroso cask. Um, I, we didn't enjoy it. The first two, three pours, um, I, it was a bit of a shame. I was like, I'm not enjoying this. Now it's it's wonderful. Yeah. The Brook Gladdy thing is there. Uh, the slightly kind of creamy, uh, uh, almost dairy aspect is there, but it's very mild. Um, and the sherry just brings kind of nice bright red fruit and contrasting things. It's a great dram. I'm getting through that bottle quite well. And it's one of those ones that you you won't even be able to go and pick up at auction because it's literally something that was gifted to me from somebody's own own kind of mini private bottling. Um, I'm, I'm excited for Brook Laddie in the future. And I'm excited particularly for what they've done for that island. It's quite an amazing story, right? Yeah. How many people have jobs? I think they're employing in triple figures now. Is that true? Because yeah. everything is on site. And you know, I, I don't know the the size of the staff today. I, I was pretty impressed two years ago, even you know, to see how that's yeah, like, because they, they try and keep as much of it in house and on the island as possible. They're trying to do as much as they can on site in terms of bottling plants and installing salad and. Uh, flo floor maltings and things like that, crazy oh, yeah. stuff, but they're really invested in the future and what they're doing. And I think that needs to be celebrated. And when it connects with people, so much the better. Yeah. I hope, Ben, because you and I have never managed to get to the island together. I was supposed to go over uh, in, in May, and for, you know, for obvious reasons, I'm not. Reasons that will not be named in this yes. club, but- uh, You and I both, we were both gonna be there in May. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but look, the island's not going anywhere, and my love for the island isn't going anywhere. So, we'll just have to put it on pause for a moment. And this is not a cancellation. Time. This is merely a pause, absolutely. Yeah. A, a postponement, a delay. I agree with you fully. Yeah. My friend, I hope you can stay till the end of the stream. I'm going to pull everybody in that's still hanging out in the green room behind yeah. um, so that we can all share the quiz together. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a kind quiz. <laughs> Um, but if you if you want to stay, if you have the time to hang out with us, I would very much welcome you. If you can't, I understand completely. And thanks so much for taking time out of your day um, to come and hang with us, to be our host at Brook Laddie. And uh, maybe when we have maybe uh, an SMWS, independent bottling theme or whatever it may be, or just the need for somebody as cool as you to come and join us in the future, you'll come back again. Thanks, Roy. I'll be your poster boy whenever you need me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks sure. for indulging us, Ben. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. I hope he doesn't hold that against me. Fabulous guy. So there we have it, Brook Laddie. We could have talked about any of these distilleries on and on and on for a long time, of course. There's so much to talk about, but this is just meant as a kind of whistle-stop tour crazy idea for a theme for a pub. Uh, ben Marnock is here. Ronnie, good to see you. Aquavidi, my son, is trying some Islas tonight. For the first time, to my surprise, he likes Lefroy and Colhoman, Sanic. 
was keen on a young smokehead, which is Kalila, I believe. Often it can be. Ronnie, that's amazing. I think that I've talked often on this channel about how peated whiskies can be the thing that finally gives people that hook um, and that, 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 that motivation to suddenly explore and taste um, and understand that whiskey is not all the same. Smoke and PT whiskies can be powerful for that. So don't shy away from giving beginners PT whiskies, especially things like Lafroy 10, honestly, because the, the, the lower ABV makes it sit with them that little bit easier. Michael at Sunday Evening Scotch is saying, cheers to Ben and long live the SMWS. Thank you, Michael. Eric Evanson is saying, what kind of production does Brick Laddie have, as well as how many warehouses? Oh, wow, now you're asking. Maybe Ben would have known the answers to that, Eric. Um, but in terms of what type of production that they have, um, I mean, it's a fairly large plant now. Brick Laddie is turning over a decent amount of product now, um, one and a half million litres. Um, I mean, it's still on a smaller end of Isla now, but considering that it's a revived distillery of all the product that they produce goes into single malt. But more, uh, they produce more spirit for gin than they do whiskey nowadays. Um, they put in a gin, they call it the botanist gin, it's a very, very good gin. Um, and they did it because uh, they, they obviously, at the time, they needed to uh, make money while they were waiting to make the most of their whiskey. But it, they hit the timing right, and uh, the gin the gin boom was here. And now the botanist has become one of the best known uh, kind of uh, higher end gins that you can buy out there. Jesus, something has just popped. I'm watching myself react to this. Something has popped in this room and I have no idea what it is. I hope you heard that. There is no burning, there is no, but there was a big, there was a big bang. I guess I'm going to discover what the hell that was some point after the stream. Unbelievable. Safety first is everything okay, says Michael. I have no idea what it... Nothing has gone off. There are no lights gone out. There's an electrical pop. There's no smell. Uh, let me just check outside and I'll be back with you momentarily. A wee bit of drama on a tour of Isla. Guys, I don't know what that's all about. I hope you realise that I'm not going crazy. I hope that you heard that noise, but it was a big noise. The ghost of Bamoa, somebody has said there. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. It's very strange. Isn't it just typical that it would happen when it's alive? Well, I suppose it could be worse. There are no lights disappeared. Everything seems fine. So let's uh, let's see. Willie Dolier is asking if it's my son James with a party popper. That's what it sounded like. It sounded exactly like a party popper. Spirit Watch Thomas saying we heard it. It's very, very weird. These are weird times. The tour is still happening. The bus is still rolling until such a point that there is smoke or fire or bad smells. The trouble is, is that I'm not going to smell it past all the smoky whiskey that's in front of me. Okay, let's uh, let's just skip past that and move on. <laughs> oh my goodness. My goodness. Um, let's move on. Um, we're only going to make a quick pause and pit stop as we move over towards Machir Bay and Kilhoman. I have had a mixed relationship also with Kilhoman. 
I'll never forget one of the first bottlings that they ever released during one of my first trips to Fischiel back in, I think that would have been 2010, it would have been for my 40th in 2010. And my friend Bill, who you recognise from a couple of videos and things, who's often in his Whiskey Disciple in the chats, he was uh, he went to the local shop and we bought one of the first ever releases from Colhoman and we opened it round the fire in the back garden of the Moore Hotel and pretty much trained the bottle over the course of that Fischiel visit that week. And I had very fond memories of it. Um, but when I was buying Kilhomans since then, uh, one would be enjoyed. It was very, very nice. And others were like this, fourth edition, 100% Isla. I, I don't know how long I've had this. But it's been a long time since the fourth edition was new. So I'm going to guess that this is probably something like a 2002. 13 release, something like that, 2014 maybe, um, of that order. And I this this has got such a strong agricultural note that I often it's like you're visiting a kid's farm, a petting zoo or something, and I've never ever connected with this whiskey. However, you persist. And over the years, there have been delights, real delights from Kilhoman. And I have to say that this is one of them. Um, this is at 46%. It was a, a, a fairly wide release, 2009 vintage. So when I bought this, it was a nine-year-old, I think. It was a nine-year-old whiskey. 2018, two years ago, again, when I was over there with Bill. And um, I love this bottle. And I save it for... Uh, such times as I'm in the mood for it. Kilhoman cannot keep up with demand. They have immediately built a cult fan base. They've done fantastic things with their whiskey, fantastic things with their marketing, and they keep expanding and expanding. And literally, they, they, they cannot keep up. Their special releases when they come out are gone before you can even, you know... Ah. It's, it's gone beyond the point you need to be a, a really extreme fan in order to track them down sometimes. The core range has grown extensively, and I think they're doing a great job. The tour gets better all the time as well, and they've got a fantastic little cafe there. So where food at that end of the island can be a bit harder to come by, always remember that Colhoman do nice traditional food. So after the Brook Laddie, we're straight back into the PT, super PT end of things now. But that butteriness, not as sweet on the nose as some of the others that we've had tonight. <sighs> Our baggy Andy saying, I've just watched the stream back. The plant to your rear was moving at the, <laughs> at the time of the bang. <laughs> WTF. Everything looks good, Andy. So, um, and it's a, it's maybe not a real plant, but it's not an electric plant. It was an electric pot, that's what it sounded like. It was just something falling. Let's see. After the stream's over, I'll work out what all the drama is about. Jimmy Lang is saying, that's not a plant. <laughs> Skogmard is saying, thanks for the tour, I believe. Uh, I suggested something like this back in January. Fantastic execution with so many guests. Scogsmart, if you did, thank you very, very much. It might have been you that planted the seed, my friend. Ebhead um, Rolf was saying that uh, we need to get an update on this mystery. I will be sure to share it with everyone. McAllen Fine Herrera is saying I had the bottle of the 2017 12-year-old cast strength for a barfly who can answer a lag villain question. Oh, we never did that. I still have some bottles on my shelves. Legal shipping from Germany must be possible. Let's bring you in. Uh, do you want to give me a thumbs up if you want to come in and do the question for us? Uh, that's good. We forgot to do that. Um, yeah. You want to share a dram? Uh, no, I'm talking a bottle. When I say bottle, I mean bottle. So I'm talking about this. Oops. You're going to you're going to share a bottle. Sure. Can I enter? <laughs> <laughs> If you answer first, you can enter. No, 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 oh, absolutely not. Not at all. Not at all. I will not participate. I have another one for you do. anyway, so don't worry. What, what is the bottle you have? Uh, the 2017 Lagavulin 12 cast strength. 
Oh my God, it's so so generous as well. Can also the famous one of which I have something oh. that Doc gifted oh, to me okay. for my birthday last year as well. Um, Still some left. Uh, sorry. Still something left. Oh yes. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Not, 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 not enough. <laughs> not enough. Um, but that's a fantastic gesture, Doc. Thank you so much. Um, did you hear that bang? Yes, I did. I was shocked. Yeah. I I can't fathom it. Let's uh let's uh let's hear your question, my friend. Okay, let me have a look at the chat first. So here comes the question. What is the nickname of Peter Mackey? Peter Mackey's nickname. We didn't really talk about Peter Mackey, did we? Yeah, we wanted to, but uh, time yeah. flies. He was a, a tyrant. Um, at Lagavulin, he's the guy that's responsible for Malt Mill. Pinky is Ian MacArthur, so it's a nice try, but <laughs> it's not him. Uh, Nigel, Pink. Nigel Slynn, there you go. Rest Restless Peter. Peter. No, I would answer. not have been able to claim that bottle because while I recognize that it was Restless Peter, uh, well done, Nigel, well done to you. Um, I, I, uh, I had forgotten it, but it is Restless Peter Mackey. Yes, correct. Um, I'm sure he would have been an interesting guy. So what should we do there, Doc? Should uh, Nigel get in touch with, with me and then I can put you guys in touch? Yeah, I think that's, that's a, the easiest option. I think that's easy. But then again, I mean, my, my email is, is straightforward, McAllen, fine and rare, all one word at gmail.com. So just contact me directly. Nigel, if you have any trouble getting a hold of Doc, uh, get a hold. Then of, use, uh, use Roy, right, right. to me. Right, so um, congrats. As can I keep you in here, Doc? Because we've lost Roddy tonight. Roddy is uh, under the weather. He was the guy who was going to be originally sitting next to me, and then, of course, um, because of the isolation thing, uh, he was going to just dial in remotely and be our host at Kalila. But he's feeling under the weather with a temperature and a cough and uh, a woolly head. He says, so he's uh, nursing himself at home. Um, maybe we could hang out together, and uh, as we head round to uh, Kalila, how do you feel about sure. that? Sure. Like Kalila as well, and have some, as you can tell. So we'll enjoy this wee sip of Kalhoman. All right, I'm still on the on the uh, Caden hats, like a woman. I poured far too big a dram of that there. I've got I've got quite a few whiskeys to finish as, at the end of this stream tonight. <laughs> Let's uh, chat to the uh, the lounge quickly. Um, Service Alafis is saying, what a gesture. McAllen Fine and Rare, fantastic. Absolutely, you're spot on. McAllen Fine and Rare, you're a legend, mate. Nigel Slynn is going to be a very, very happy guy. Now, it's a 2017-12, isn't it? Yes. So, Nigel, if you didn't know beforehand, um, you'll know what everybody's talking about. I mean, the, the difference isn't so huge that the 2017 release is the only one to go for, um, but it's getting more expensive all the time, and if you're going to yeah. go out and spend £100 try and track down the two, 2017 because it was just such a perfect example of the style. Would you agree, Doc? Yeah, for me, that was the nicest one I, I had. I also just, uh, two weeks ago, I was uh, probably at the last whiskey show that took place in Frankfurt uh, after before the close down, so to speak. And yes. we had different Lagavulins. And we also had the 12-year-old Cast Strength uh, 2019, I think. There's no 2020 out so far as I know, as far as I know. And That's uh, right. I had a lot, uh, and this is honestly by far my favorite. But I have to admit, they are quite similar. So it's not like they're completely different. Oh, yeah. they, they are. They are. And sometimes it's just it's just the slightest kind of hint or nuance or slightly different shade that comes in to change it. But it makes it compelling. It makes it so compelling. Um, I love the velvety texture. I love the quiet space. I love the sweetness. I love that 2017. And it's all it's almost it's always difficult and it's it's nice to be in the company of of a real expert who's very good at defining what they're experiencing in the glass because it can bring so much more enjoyment for you. Um, but oftentimes you don't need to define it, you just need to simply enjoy it. And everyone can do that regardless of your level, right? Absolutely. All of sometimes just putting it into words and a language is the tricky part. Let's read some of these comments. Uh, the Malt Cask Eddie is saying, going for a Kalila, 19 from old Malt Cask. 
Fraser Bell is saying, I'm tapping out. Got to be up early for homeschooling. You and me too, Fraser. I hope it goes well for you tomorrow. Mine's is fraught. It's, it's difficult. I have to take my hat off to all teachers out there. Andrew Butler is saying, I can't type that fast. <laughs> he was obviously talking about the, the competition entry for the, the lag villain. Rob C is saying, when's Arnahol meant to start shipping 2023? Well, we don't know yet. They're keeping it under their hat, but they were talking about that they don't think it's going to be any younger than about six, seven years old or beyond. So I think 2023 is probably going to be a wee bit early. Neil Cochran is saying, Mark Watt said, thank God for Kalila. He is so right. Do you know the amount of times I've heard that very, very phrase, Neil Cochran, um, is, is unbelievable. Everybody, that is the thing that they talk about, thank God for Kalila. And what people mean when they say that is Kalila does all the heavy lifting for the island. It does six and a half million litres of very consistent, very clean, very classy, peated Isla product. And it means that it takes a lot of pressure of a, a, a lot of the other distilleries to provide product for blends. <laughs> Nigel Slynn is saying, Aquavita, I heard the noise you made about that bottle. <laughs> um, Eric Evanson is saying, you had the Arnaho new make. Yes, I did. Um, it was it was very, very good, very enjoyable. Um, but it, you, you can't tell from new make what the mature product is going to be, honestly. Um, most new make tastes okay to me most of the time. Andrew Butler is saying, my Kalila is an 11-year-old from GM from Carnegie, Carnegie Whiskey Cellars in Dornock. Um, and Kevin Bryant is saying, give out a suspension and a few detentions, problem sorted. I try that, but my kids are far more stubborn, far stronger, far more challenging than you might imagine. Hoyt is saying, do you like the unpeated Kalila? Uh, I, I like it fine. I, I think I like it's okay. It's good whiskey, but uh, it's not Kalila to me. It's not the reason why I reach for a Kalila. I agree. Um, you agree, yeah. I've had a couple of them, and I understand why they exist, and Kalila used to make a a Highland style of whiskey, as did our beg once upon a time, um, whether it was unpeated. Uh, but sometimes, uh, if you leave a Kalila unpeated in an empty glass and you cover it and come down the next morning and take the lid off, you smell peat. Oh. That's right, from unpeated Kalila. Scogs Mard is saying, who makes the peatiest scotch not from Isla? I have no idea. And it depends on how you measure it as well. Are you talking about on the yeah. pallet? Are you talking about PPM at bottling point? Are you talking about PPM of the barley? Um, honestly, I don't know the question of that. Um, I don't think it's about that. It's about how the peat plays in the glass, how it integrates, how it how it displays. Um, yeah, probably Ben Riach would be my my answer. Eric Evans has seen Aquavita. You had more drams at the La Quinta, and you're fine. You can do it. Yes, but I didn't need to run a live stream with guests when I was at La Quinta. I was just hanging out with all you guys and what a night it was. Doc, fantastic. So if we talk about Kalila and the fact that it is, um, I mean, honestly, one of the, quite an amazing thing when you think about it, that it's able to put out so much product. And you know that because there's so much available from independent bottlers. If you find an independent Isla, what's it going to be? Probably Kalila. It's probably going to be Kalila. And most of the time it says Kalila on the label, but often it's hidden and we don't know what it is. Chances are it's Kalila. Yeah, Pot um, S cake is a good example. I think the majority, the vast majority. That's right. That's absolutely right. Now, not exclusively. There are Port Askigs. Now, people think that Port Askig is the bottling of Port Askig, which is always a single malt. It's just from an undisclosed distillery. It's going to be from Kalila because Kalila is close to Port Askig, but so is Bunahaven, and there are occasionally, possibly, are Bunahaven Port Askigs. And I've got one that I am absolutely con convinced it's Lagavulin. Um, so, you know, don't consider that just because it's Port Askig that it's Kalila. Um, although, for the same reason that most of the Indies are Kalila, it's probably the same. Bunahaven, Bamor. Uh, Lagavulin, there are other uh, Isla distilleries that you can find in independent bottlings. Doc, I've just poured a glass of this. Oh, nice. <laughs> now, you don't have any of this open, do you? Not open, it's up there. <laughs> I know this whiskey very well now. You can see how much I've enjoyed this. I, I originally opened this after you gifted it to me last May when, um, when I was on Isla with the Scotch Test Dummies with, when I was over there with Scott and Bart. Yeah, I remember. And uh, we enjoyed it together. 
And last night, Jess opened opened a bottle of, of the Kalila 25. <sighs> last night, did he? Yeah. I have to say, um, it's one of those bottles that's, be, that's got better over time. What, one word that I constantly find myself reaching for when I talk about Kalila, and I don't know if you'll get this, is elegant. It doesn't make sense that a PTPT Isla could be elegant, but I always find, especially with this 12-year-old, I yeah. always find that when I'm struggling to define it between an Arbeg 10 and a Lagavulin 8 and all of these things, because when you sip them in contrast, you can taste the difference. Whether you could repeat it again when you're doing it blind is a different thing, of course. But I find that the Kalila, to me, strikes me as an elegant peated whiskey. It's off, this isn't, Kalila is often lemony to me and sweet, like sugared lemons. Um, mm -hmm. But this, this is quiet and soft and rich. Some prune, some dried fruit, but not obvious, not like sherry bomb, but just kind of that's the kind of fruit. Maybe like a cherry thing. Speaking of Kalila, I, I you know that I am a fan of this book, and uh, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, so Pete Smoke and Spirit. Oh, it's always difficult. <laughs> Pete Smoke and Spirit by yes. Andrew Jefford. And I learned in this book uh, that actually Kalila and Lagavulin have the exact same malt specifications, uh, <laughs> but the output is very different, as we all know. Uh, and they basically claim it's it's linked to the the shapes of the stills, the way they run the stills and the fill levels, and so forth. So it's really interesting. Well, that kind of plays into what I was talking about when we talk about um, the malt. When when we when you talk about the same malt specification, you're literally talking about the ppm of the malted barley when it arrives on site. That's basically what it boils down to, yeah, and probably also the type of barley. I don't know. Um, now, uh, Ian uh, MacArthur at Lagavulin will tell you that uh, so many distilleries will tell you that ours is uh, 40, ours is 28 ppm and things, but I, I think it's it's much more of a, there's much more tolerance in it than that. And, and Ian MacArthur will tell you that it's 34 to 38 ppm at Lagavulin, which suggests the same at, um, at Kalila. Now, how after that malt has gone through a mashing and fermentation and distillation, redistillation, and then however many years on a note cask, how that 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 peat, those fennels play in the glass is completely different. Yes, and the book also talks about it. They say uh, for Lagavulin, it's uh, in in the finished in the new make spirit, it's sixteen to eighteen ppm, and for Kolila, I think it was twelve to fourteen, so significantly lo lower than um, than Lagavulin. And I know that it's widely accepted that Kalila is a lighter uh, peat experience than Lagavulin. In my experience, uh, and, and I know that I struggle with peat, everybody in the channel, everybody that knows, knows how much I struggle with it. But when you sip in in contrast, I think Kalila plays on the palate just as peated as a Lagavulin. Mm. And sometimes even an Arbeg 10, which to me, forget about your Octomores and your Port Charlottes and your Colhomans. Our beg, to me, to my palate, is probably the peatiest Isla. Um, but sometimes when you sit backwards and forwards in contrast, you seem to, I don't know, you seem to get the same, I get the same peat hit out of a Kalila as anything, at Kalila as yeah. anything else. Especially when you go back and forth, I get completely lost because peat fatigue kicks in and it's really, <sighs> really difficult at some point. It, it's real, big guy. Peat fatigue is real. And, and honestly I'm... speaking, for, with this, I don't get any smoke whatsoever. Anymore, and what what's that that you're having? Yeah, like a woman, the um, the nine year old kid again. Incredible, right? Nine year old oh. like a villain when Pete should be at its it's, it's <laughs> yeah. prime, right? It's it's big prime. Ass. But your brain is very good at dialing it out. Yeah. The problem is, is when that becomes chronic, like me, where I can literally <laughs> not have a whiskey in two days and go back to a peated whiskey and still remain in a situation where the peat is dialed out. So it's nice to kind of go back and stay away from peated for a wee while and. Try and get it back again, and it does come mm. back. Scogsmart is asking, do Kalila outproduce all the other distilleries on Isla combined, or is it not quite that big? Not quite that big, no. Oh, no. So our beg is expanded up to about uh, 2.4 million litres, 
Um, Lagavulin is sitting about two million no, liters there about. Not two point six. Two point six. Yeah. Lagavulin. Okay. Two point six. They upped. They upped their output. They reduced uh, mesh um, slots, time slots for meshing down to four hours and, and twenty eight meshes per week. Blah blah blah. So they really at maximum. There's always a bottleneck that they have to uh, yeah. overcome somewhere. Um, um, and Kalila is six and a half million. So it's about two to three times the size of those. Um, Bunahaven is about three million. Uh, Brooklady is one and a half million. Colt Holman is, is uh, uh, behind Ardenho, the smallest, about half a million. Ardenho is going to be a decent player. It's going to be making a decent output. Kalila is by far the biggest at six and a half million litres, which is why everybody says thank God for Kalila because it means that there's Isla whiskey out there for everyone. Literally, it takes Good a lot point. of pressure off. Um, Vicky Thompson is saying, uh, McCann Fine Rare and Aquaviti, this SMWS Kalila has a bubble gum nose. Bubble gum is something I often get on sweet young PT whiskey, such as Kalila, Lagavulin, sometimes Kilholman, and some others as well. Absolutely, Vicky. Um, so as we stop and pause at Kalila, can I say that it's one of the most fascinating locations to go? It's got a decent tour as well because you get a tour around a factory, a real kind of high, very, very production focused. Not much time or consideration has ever been given to a visitor there. So it's quite an industrial experience as you go around, but the still room is amazing. Glass fronted still room, sister That's design to Klein Leash, right? And interestingly, the boat, Kalila was pretty much rebuilt in the late 60s, early 70s, the same as Klein Leash. Um, and people often talk about old Kalila versus new Kalila. But now that it's 50 years ago, everything is old. <laughs> There's no new Kalila, right? It's, but I have tasted Kalila from pre-refurbishment, um, if you like. And yeah, it was wonderful, wonderful whiskey and a treat to, to enjoy. But I have never, I've not, I've not had enough of it to make any comment on how it compares or whether it became better or worse. Certainly, we have to admit that Kalila is probably one of the most consistent producers out there. Um, that seems to be widely accepted. Kalila and Buna best tours on Isla says Billy Saunders, and Eric Waite is saying Kalila has one of the most beautiful views as well, second only to Buna Haven. You have to have caught the view from up. Top of the hill at Ardnaho as well. Arnaho so nice, northeast, yeah. northeast of Isla is just a, a fabulous place. If you're looking for views and sea and landscape and cloud and weather fronts and all that contrast, northeast of Isla is the place to go. Absolutely. Stu Baby is saying Aquavita, I generally dial in on the Kalila and Johnny Walker Green. Good for you. I can see that our host at Bunahaven has joined us. So we are knocking on for two hours into the stream. I apologize that we have uh, gone late. We always do. Succinct isn't why people come here, right? <laughs> um, it's the way it is. It's the way it is. Thank you so much, Doc, once more for joining us at Kalila. Um, I guess it's under the same umbrella as Lagavulin, so it was quite easy <laughs> a fit for you to come up right. and host us here. And thank right. you for your super, super generous giveaway. And congratulations to Nigel Slynn for snagging that as well. I'm very jealous, Nigel, but I do have one here. So it's gone to Sweet. the right guy. You're, you're in good shape. Thank you, Doc, you superstar. Thanks, everybody. Slanjava. So I'm hoping that our final host for the evening uh, can uh, join us a wee bit to talk about uh, Scott from the Scottish Test Dummies, talk about his Buna Haven epiphanies. I've got a lineup of drams in front of me here, a whole flight of Isla whiskies is quite amazing. Um, I'm going to need to um, spend a bit of time after the stream and enjoy these and not see that they go to waste and just pour wee tablespoons. So as we leave Lagavulin, sorry, if we leave Kalila, and we drive away from Port Askig up towards the most difficult point on Isla to, to reach is Bunahaven. But as you go towards Bunahaven, you have to tackle this afterthought of a single track road. Honestly, it's it's it was never there. When the distillery was there, they, they realised in time that they would have to put in road access as well. But the distillery was built fully for boat 
access. It was very, very interesting because Brook Laddie and Bunahaven were both built at the same time. And they were built at a time that coal was a big thing, but there is no coal on Isla. And the only way to get coal on Isla would have been by boat. But it's very difficult to get things in and out by sea on Isla when the sea can be so volatile. And some of these bays look like boats can access them quite easily, but underneath the water it's fraught with danger. But then along came these flat bottomed puffers and coal could be brought right in to Bunahaven and to Brookladdy. And suddenly on Isla, the flavor profile changes just by circumstance, that crazy thing that happens. They don't need peat as the fuel, they've got coal. And to this day, Bunahaven and Brookladdy are typically or more associated with less PT styles. But of course, we know uh, Bunahaven with its uh, Stoisha and its Moynia releases, and um, they do very, very PT whiskies, as does Brookladdy with Port Charlotte and Octomore. But it's very, very interesting how these things conspire uh, to make a style of whiskey that wasn't really designed, it was a product of its circumstance. Che Francis is saying, uh, Bunahaven is definitely one of my favourites. I notice my guest is back in his chair. Give me a thumbs up if you think you're ready, my friend. Yes, he's giving me a thumbs up. Eric Evanson is saying, sad, I've not had the Bunahaven. Well, that everything will come in time. If it's for you, it doesn't go past you, Eric. Don't worry. Rob C is saying, atmosphere at Arnaho just demands they eventually age there. I think they're sending it off to Glasgow as of right now, right? It's one of the things that they're, clearly they want to warehouse and mature on site as well, but, you know, it's baby steps. They've spent a lot of money putting in uh, a really interesting distillery there, uh, full of the best intentions. I think the warehousing, hopefully, will come in time, and I agree with you fully, Rob. Scott Smart is saying you should start opening the V-Pub doors an hour earlier, then the streams might not run so late into the nights. You need to have a wee chat with my wife and see how that goes down. Maybe you'll fare a wee bit better than I have, my friend. I'm going to stop at our final point on the tour of Isla today at Bunahaven, the northeastern point on Isla, and I'm going to invite in our final host of this week in a mini virtual tour. Um, and uh, I, I often have to kind of think about how crazy this is, that the, the guy I'm about to invite in... Um, was on a channel that I used to watch as a fan and somebody who loved what they were doing. It was these two guys out in Kansas in the States and I always talk about this. I used to just love watching their content and it was one of the first live streams that I actually sat up late, very late to enjoy um, was a Scotch Test Dummies live stream. And um, the first interaction of me being in a live chat anywhere, not as Aquavitae, was also on a Scotch Test Dummies live stream. It was a Tomatin live stream with Scott Fraser and Scott Adamson. Um, and then as I watched them as a fan, and then I started to do my own thing, and we started to work together and collaborate together. And now I've had the privilege of welcoming them into my own country, into Scotland. And I'm very, very grateful to call them both friends. But one of them is joining us tonight, and he is uh, the superstar that is Scott Bruno. <laughs> Hiya, buddy. How are you? Beat your introductions, Roy. Thank uh, you. I love the T-shirt. Look at the T-shirt. I know. And uh, I was going through. I was like, "Where's my Where's my Aqua Vita T-shirt at?" And I found this one. It looks like I'm on the left boob, and you are on the right boob. <laughs> it's a large. It's kind of. Uh, I don't know if I've ever wore it. It wasn't too long ago. I took it out of the bag. Well, do you know? Um, just as I think about it now, do you know who gave us those shirts and did that for us? The well, same guy that put the graphics on the car for our yep. tour last year and everything, and he did the whole lot free of charge. He wouldn't charge any money for it. I gifted him a bottle. I know that we were all very, very grateful to him, but it was Bob Scully, and I'll give him a shout out as well. He also gave me a large sample of Port Ellen to take along in that tour as well. Um, I. We didn't have an opportunity to share it. I did carry it in the car, um, but I since shared it with Matt over at Ear Whiskey um, for a live stream so that I could uh, get share some Port Ellen with him as well. So let's raise a wee glass to Bob Scullion and say thanks for the T-shirt and all the graphics. T-shirt and the, uh, the car design. Mm. Yeah, that, that car's become um, a bit of a thing in the videos, right? It's like <laughs> it's, it's become a, a – we, we like to uh, – Going to, and in America, that would be a soccer mom car, as I understand. Yep, yep, that's what yep. we'd call it here. Yep, yep. 
a soccer mom car. I'll so say now, real quick, uh, all the guests though, everybody's looking great. I thought um, if they've been quarantined or self quarantined or sitting in their houses, Ard Baggy's looking great. Doc is looking good. Ben's looking good. Looks like everybody's weathering the storm fairly well. Um, uh, the only it's I've been it's been pointed out that I've got a sore eye. <laughs> oh. So maybe it's only me that's not looking so good tonight. Did you hear the explosion earlier? I did. Yeah, I was watching when that happened, and I don't know. I thought it sounded like a like a a, a bottle cork or something popped, maybe from pressure, or maybe you've got a sample bottle somewhere that was shipped in the air because I've seen those crack and blow before. From yeah, well, well, I'm, you, I'm almost hoping that it's the smell of electrical burning rather than spilled and ruined whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> but it was crazy. There was just this big pop. I mean, it might be just be a battery charging somewhere or a power supply or a capacitor. It maybe be a, a capacitor pop or something. There's no smell. There's no burning. I'm still, everything seems fine. So the wheels stay on. The wheels stay on and we go forward. Listen, buddy, thank you so much for joining. You can, you know exactly why I reached out to you to host us at Buna Haven, right? Yes. I have to, can I, can I make a wee further introduction here? Mm -hmm. Because it meant a lot to me at the time, and it was in May last year when you guys were over. We were all having a fantastic time in Glasgow and in Edinburgh together. It was, it was great, and we're all up together with the community. And then we had to travel over to Isla in the really cloudy weather. You'll remember the crossing. And then we had a fantastic time at our beg. But the next day, something happened to you at Bunahaven. And I noticed that you, instead of being, right, okay, we're here to work, we're here to film, we're here to gather in information, I saw you suddenly flick a switch and you were like, screw this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about it. You know, and that's um, in, in the second video that you just did where we're at Lagavulin and we sit down and we're talking to Bruno and um, – Tapia? Tapita. Yeah. Tapita. Yeah. And, and I tell them then, it's like, you know, you can watch videos, you can look in, in, at photos, you can see pictures of distilleries, but until you're on Isla and you're feeling the atmosphere, the air, you're, you're smelling the distilleries, the, the history that's there. And that, that next morning at Bunahaven is where it really hit me. Uh, you know, you're not just, you're not just at a distillery, you know, you're on Isla in Scotland at Bunahaven. And I was already enjoying Bunahaven at the time and it's grown tremendously since then. I, I remember we'd finished the tour and uh, we would, we'd been talking to the guys there and things Hey, I was I was running about trying to get B-roll and filming things, and you guys had just disappeared. You'd just walked off somewhere, and you'd walked all the way around the headland there. You'd walked around almost if you, if you'd walked another uh, another half mile further. There's actually, or there used to be. I don't know if it's dissolved or rusted away now. There used to be a a big uh, shipwreck out there that, you, that was wrecked off the coast there. But you were out there and you were looking across to Jura and things like that. And this is what I encourage people to do when they take tours, and, and everybody goes around, around it differently, but I think there's a huge benefit to spending time getting there early and, and kind of breathing in the air and, and taking a measure of the place, enjoying the tour at a leisurely place, a pace, sorry, upgrade the tour if you can. Don't just do the standard tour, premiumize the tour, do a warehouse tour or a blending tour or whatever they may offer. Um, and then afterwards, don't rush away, spend a bit of time. And we had the luxury of doing that that that, that day, and I think it, it made uh, not just a nice day, but a lasting memory, a feeling that you can recall. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And that was, I mean, when you know, you helped us out tremendously and uh, with everything uh, setting. And but one of our uh, requests was, hey, we don't want to feel rushed. One, maybe two distilleries a day. We know there's a lot more distilleries in Scotland than that. And we're there. We're going to tour for, what, four or five days. Yep, yep. You know, if we do six, seven, or eight distilleries, that's fine with us because we want, we didn't want to have to get to one distillery, have two hours there where you're, you're unloading, you're hitting the tour, you're getting loaded back up, and you're going to the next distillery. That just wasn't what we wanted to do. So it was perfect. 
Uh, and this day you had Boone Hoven lined up in the morning. The afternoon was open. You'd planned um, just a quick stop in at Kilhoman on our way to Machir Bay. And that's where we spent the day at. No rush, no worries. And it was awesome. Yeah, that's right. And I think that you made the point that we are all super interested in what makes one whiskey different from the other. So you want to understand cut points and fermentation times and distillation times and all of these things. We're geeks, we're enthusiasts. But it doesn't always have to happen at the same time. And once you understand the basic structure and production of whiskey, okay, that, that's, an, you're, that's not why a visitor like you is there. You're there to take in much more than the whiskey production. And I, I think that, that it's days like that, that that makes it clear why I try to advise people to do that, to take a bit of the atmosphere and the, the environment in as well. Um, and Neil Cochran is saying, do the Warehouse 9 and the maturation tour. As well. It was a Warehouse 9 tour that we did. Um, now, I was driving, so I could I could literally only touch one or two to my lips. I was, I was at the pilot that day. Um, but Scott Bart and uh, and Bill, you guys were you had a lovely, warm, relaxed glow. You were very happy, and I have to say, it's down to drums like this. I don't know what you is that. Have we got the same bottle? Is that the Amontillado? Yep, yep. Fantastic. That's the same one. Yeah, we had that during the Warehouse Nine tasting, and me and both uh, you and I really love that one. Even and you know, and they had the they had a PX Moignier in there and it just wasn't um it didn't feel like the fagiel release from the year before it was still a good whiskey but this amontillado uh finish one was just outstanding yeah well i think the one i gifted to you was a p it wasn't wasn't a px it was an oloroso a moño oloroso um oh was it was it oloroso not px okay that's right yeah i wish i'd i'd, I'd i should have i should have downloaded that little segment of you with your head in your hands yeah. reviewing that and just going oh my god and then bart kind of just looking at it and chewing and saying this is the reason i love whiskey yeah <laughs> and then and you turning around to him and saying something like uh you better hide this bottle because you're not getting to keep this here. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, it's over at Bard's though too. But what I poured though, and what I talked, what I mentioned to you the other day, this is a twenty-year-old Bunahaven Paulo Cortado. Yes, uh, fifty-four point nine percent. And I just popped it before the show. I poured it to let it sit for a little bit. It does not disappoint, Roy. I'm setting some of this aside for you, and it is um, one of the uh, one of the best whiskeys I've had. Oh wow! Yeah. Now there's you tried to buy that at Buna Haven. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the what would have been two nights before that at your place, the first Paulo Cortado I had was that Deanston Twelve Year. Man, I really enjoyed that. That was really nice. Yeah. Surprisingly, we get to Buna Haven, and what do they have sitting there on the on the wall? Is uh, their own Buna Haven Paulo Cortado, and immediately I'm like, I want one of those. With a little snicker, they're like, oh, no, those are gone. <laughs> those have been sold out for a while. Yeah, we just, yeah. We, just we just put that there to tease guys like you. Right? <laughs> I know. Why would you even have it out if you don't have any of it? <laughs> but, no, when I got back, and that so that was last May, um, probably October time frame or so. I've been looking online and, and debating uh, in the States here. This is a 750 milliliter uh, a store on the East Coast had these and pretty pricey. I want to say it was 440, maybe $460. But uh, I finally pulled the trigger on it and it's been sitting here. I just popped it just to enjoy with you. And like I say, this does not disappoint. I also have the 30 year Bunahaven Marsala cask. And um, it's good too, but this is head and shoulders above it. This this blows that thirty year Bunahaven Marsala out of the water. Wow! This wow! Good. This is good. And what's really interesting about a Palo Cortado cask is a concept Palo Cortado isn't designed. It's when the floor, the 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 fermentation layer on top of the sherry dies by often unknown reasons. And it, and it matures and it develops it as a different sherry. And nobody designs that. And the name Palo Cortado comes from that chalk mark uh, 
uh, palo bean stick and cortado meaning cut in Spanish, so cut stick. So instead of the, the chalk mark remaining solid, when the floor dies away, they put a cut through it and that's how it gets its name. So people can't design that sherry, they can't design those casks, so they're very rare casks as I understand. Um, but I have to say our experience with whiskey in a Palo Cortado cask has been pretty positive so far. Oh, yeah. Now, what was now Palo Cortado, though, is it from is it Manzanilla that creates that or is it Amontillado? What's the uh, well, it's, it has to be one that's aged under floor. So uh, I'm I not sure. I think it's Manzanilla when um, the Manzanilla sherry when it's. When it's aging, something happens. The reaction in there with uh, uh, just, I mean, the, the man's with, in with the, the, with the yeast in the air, the flora and fauna that's just it, floating about in the air or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It creates, it creates Palo Cortado. And I don't know if they can, can you plan it? Can, can a uh, wine? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think, think so either. I think it, it just happens. It happens. I had, I had somebody say that one in every hundred casks, so one percent of sherry casks, it happens to. It's anecdotal. I don't quote me on that. It was just somebody I was speaking to, but um, it, it's quite a rare thing. But I have to say this. We're, we're not sipping Palo Cortado. I'm not. I'm sipping the Amontillado right now. And this is rich. This is a rich, heavy, syrupy, seductive thing. It's it's quite amazing. And it's not what you would associate traditional Bunahaven to be. Bunahaven was an unpeated Isla style. It was quite light. We knew it from its 12-year-old for years. 12-year-olds get much better over the years, but this is altogether uh, an appetizing thing. What are you saying, <laughs> this one? No, I got the Paulo Cortado. Oh, you bastard. Thought, yeah. <laughs> I'll get you. You're getting, you're, you'll get some of this, Roy. Mm. Mm. The, the, the PX, the Moina PX is the one that we shared on the beach that day. Yep. And I remember us commenting that the Pete was there, and the PX was there, but it wasn't as married as we'd come to enjoy with the Moigne Oloroso and with the um, with the other expressions we'd tried. Lloyd Fink, Lloyd is in here tonight. We're the beard. The beard, yes, Lloyd Fink, you star. He's bought, us, he's bought us a very generous virtual drama and said, cheers, guys. Lloyd, I hope you're doing very, very well, and I hope you're staying very, very healthy, and it's fantastic to have you join us tonight. Slant you, Lloyd Fink. Whoops. That's your coin, by the way. Hit the table. Fantastic. Cheers to Lloyd. So, I, have a comment, I have a comment highlighted uh, earlier when I was watching about the time the uh, the pop happened in the room. And I don't know if Ray Brisniak, I'm guessing on the pronunciation there. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Ray is still watching, but he says, you missed this uh, question. He says, Roy, what do you think of Scott's of the Scotch Test Dummies recycled review? <laughs> well, what people don't know is that people think that that was a kind of stealth thing that you did to kind of make fun of or catch out or whatever. But but you you fully you were you made me aware of that as you were doing it, and I uh, you asked me for the music right, or I gave you the music or whatever. Yeah, I asked you for the music, and you was a little hesitant. You wasn't for sure what I was going to do with it, and I said don't. I've got something in mind. I'm going to shoot it, and then I'll, I'll you'll you'll get to watch it. You can approve it uh, before I ever air it. Scott, can I can I can I make a confession? Uh huh. When I'm feeling a wee bit down in the dumps, <laughs> when I'm feeling a wee bit cheesed off with whiskey and whiskey YouTube, I'll occasionally pull up that video, and it's an utter tonic. It's just <laughs> fabulous. I never ever cease to, to laugh out loud at it. I remember the night that you sent me it and I don't know if it was, you hadn't released it, you were just about to release it and you sent me the video and my wife and I sat down on the sofa in front of the TV, paused the TV and we watched this video and we watched you doing that out the back and the burp that comes out as you're lying on the ground and you say, oh, I might just lie here for a little bit and things. Um, <laughs> so I hope that answers his question that it's it was superb to see absolutely superb. <laughs> that was um, fun to do too. Yeah, and it remains a, a funny thing that the amount of parodies and uh, things are, are uh, you know, I often say there are more uh, copies, parodies, homages, whatever you want to call them, to recycled reviews than there are actually recycled reviews. <laughs> but that's the that's the pinnacle. That's a peach. It's, you well, you've created your own genre. I mean, so many people are copying 
Ray's yeah. Re, Ray Roy's recycled reviews. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it's it's um I don't know what gave me the leap of confidence that that leap of faith to to decide that it was a sane thing to film yourself at your bin <laughs> throwing stuff in the um but I did it and I'm glad I did it now because yeah. I have fun, I have fun doing it now. And somebody said to me recently they said they sent a, a really endearing uh, direct message saying, Roy, I think it's wonderful, that video. They just, they're talking about the Scotch Test Dummies in Scotland Part 2. Mm. I, I, it was emotional. You know, I shed a tear. It was it was fantastic. I can't wait to get to Isla. It's just made me more determined to do it. But honestly, I'm excited for your next recycled review. <laughs> so <laughs> I, can spend, I can spend two weeks putting a video together and people enjoy it, fantastic. But I'll have more success if I do a 10-minute video standing at my, my trash can doing it. Listen, somebody's asked, Royale431 uh, asked, what was the baptism at Lagavulin all about? Why was Ian MacArthur pouring whiskey on your head? You know, I want to say probably two people each tour probably get that. It probably depends on how Ian is is feeling it probably depends on the whiskeys I th you know i think he does a good job of kind of judging the crowd yeah now we did get to uh, sample the oldest cask that's in the in the warehouse there the one that you're showing in the video and it's a 53 year old log of Ulan. and if i remember right there was a um uh, an asian family i don't know if they were china i don't remember chinese or maybe japanese that was over to our left and he yeah. he he baptized the uh, the older gentleman of the group with that fifty three year old log of Ulan. That's right. Yeah, right. just poured it on his head. So no, I got the twenty one year old sherried uh, log of Ulan. You know, but I think he kind of and from what people say, he kind of judges the atmosphere in the room if if he's going to pull out that fifty three year old or, or you know what he does. And he, he's a great showman. I mean, you can tell he's done that so many times. He knows how to work the crowd. That was a privilege because we'd obviously made our requests in advance or tried to schedule it so that we hoped it could be Ian that takes the tour. But what we need to understand that even at Lagavul and Ian, Ian MacArthur, he, you know, he's working there. He's not just a, a VIP tour guide ambassador guy. He's actually working. He's driving the forklift. He's looking after all sorts of processes in the distillery. And if he can do the tour, he'll do it. And he seems to quite enjoy it. But when he hosts that tour, and I have to say, he's going to retire in August, and I hope that there are some tours left before he retires this year because it's one of the privileges, I think, to be in the company of somebody that's worked at a company for virtually 50 years. Yeah. And I had forgot, actually, even about just that little kind of sit-down interview we did with him at the end there. And I've just, i I've, and I've watched your the, the video of yours, this part two several times and i just chuckle each time it's so funny when you know i'm like hey you, you sneak off down here in the middle of the afternoon and uh you know which one of these casks are you breaking into and i mean just with a br very brief pause he's like there's some secrets i can't tell you laddies <laughs> 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 there's just That's some right. secrets that we don't talk about he's he's the charisma he's so endearing he's he's genuinely really really down to earth really brutally honest about things um you you leave that warehouse tour and know that you've enjoyed something special honestly mark goins has just sent us across a drama as well saying so glad that y'all he's saying y'all became friends i am too mark he's saying y'all have helped usher me into this wonderful world of whiskey let's raise a dram to mark goins who put out his first live stream at the weekend and what a great job he did too oh, did he? yes He's, he's a minister. He's a Mark is also a minister. And he I did helps. not know that. I'll have to watch. Yeah. Good job, Mark. Cheers. Slancha to you, Mark. Well done, my friend. And stay safe because he is in Louisiana. I don't know if he's near New Orleans. Oh, or yeah. Orleans. One of the states that's, that's uh, having different uh, attitude to this. We had the privilege of hanging out with Mark in Texas last year. Fantastic stuff. This, uh, woo, all right, that's, we can, yeah, and someone point out, you guys are talking Lagavulin. Let's, we're, we're, let's move it back to the Bunahaven. <laughs> yes, we, we were in Bunahaven. Listen, Bunahaven's always been, when I was there for my 40th, 10 years ago, my first time on Isla, the distillery manager uh, heard 
that it was my 40th that I was there for. And he came out and, and found me and gifted me a bottle of Bunahaven 12 and gifted me for my 40th. Blown away. And it's things like that. It's the it's the location. It's the environment. It's the industrial. I always call Bunahaven beautifully ugly. And I think that makes sense to anybody that's actually been there. It's just a, a wonderfully enigmatic, um, almost kind of bizarre place to exist. And yet it does. And we're very, very grateful for it. And this Amontillado, I mean... Well, yeah, it's been a while since I poured a dram of that. That is outstanding as well. Yeah, I mean, it's so, so rich. It's so, mm -hmm. so gorgeous. And the color of it, I don't know if, uh, if that's going to come through or not. Really, it might even be a little bit darker than the, the Paulo Cortado cask. Yeah, I think you could be right. I think you could be right. But it's beautifully nutty. The, the fruits are mm -hmm. dry fruits. There's a kind of slightly dusty note there. You know, at 57 Point four percent. You think you should be reaching for water, but no, it's so rich and delicious. This is almost sixteen years old. Yes, two thousand and three, right? February of oh three to January of nineteen. So a month shy of sixteen years old. It's fifty seven point four percent, and I want to say was it about one hundred and thirty pounds? I think it was less 100, think it was 100, 100 just be, just broke 100 or something i yeah it, it could be more it could be more i, I mean it's just I, i'm sad because i tell you what i'm going to do there's only there's a heel left in this and normally i would do a heels giveaway i'm going to pour this i'm going to do a giveaway here scott i'm going to give this away to anybody who can tell me Let's see the name of the gentleman that Scott and Bart interviewed on the pier. Neil Cochran has just been saying that Scott on the pier, the video was fantastic. Is Erwin, you star, two of the best whiskey reviews on YouTube. Both of you keep up the great content. Erwin, thank you so much for your recent support and thank you for the virtual drama, friend. Cheers. P. Head is saying, Billy, yeah, you're close. Billy Walker, Billy Saunders is saying, Billy. And Ebhead Rolf has just won himself a dram of the Buna Haven 2003 Amontillado by saying it is indeed Billy Sinclair. Is that who's come up first on your chat? Uh, let's see. Everybody's seen Billy Walker getting confused with Billy Walker, who used to be of uh, Glendronic. Is now Eb Ebhead shows as the first to say Bill Sinclair. Okay, so I'm going to add that to my... The drams that I owe, of which are currently many, Rolf. <laughs> you got to meet Rolf, of course, when you were over. Uh, yep. Oh, yeah. Okay, Rolfie, I think the last of this, because it looks like it's up to here, the fill level's up to here, but they've got such a big glass mm. hole, as the dummies would say. <laughs> this, um, I can't remember what these things are called. They are really deep, aren't they? That is, I didn't even notice. I still have about three quarters in my bottle, though, so I've really been, I don't know if you can see it through there or not. Probably not. Yeah, it's just below the label there. Yeah, you've been much more careful than I have. I don't think you can see how. I can't. Well, it's not as easy for me to get another one. <laughs> well, I think there's one dram left in that, and it's Rolfie's dram. Congratulations, Rolf. Well done. Superb, my friend. Superb, Scott. Thank you so much for, for dropping in, but I think that, uh, I hope that that video that went out kind of in some way, um, I don't know, summarized the feelings and, and uh, the, the vibe of that trip last year, but it was fantastic fun, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Trip of a lifetime. Never. I, I get the impression that, that you're both keen to visit us in the motherland of whiskey oh. sometime soon as well. Oh, I hope, yes, I hope people that are into other whiskeys, forgive me for saying that, but um, if you're going to make a pilgrimage, to whiskey it's going to be scotland and if you're going to come to scotland you've got to make it to isla i think and uh, we managed that eric wait is saying aquavite is called a punt in champagne bottles lindsay holman is spot on saying punt as well mark brown punt peter box punt everybody is keeping me straight such a knowledgeable crowd scott are you interested in staying for the quiz can you stay for the quiz my friend or uh, i'll hang around for a little bit Okay, good. Fantastic. I will see if I can make it work. 
Uh, I'm not sure it's still connected. We've been having problems with Wi-Fi generally right now, right? It's it's very, very difficult. I'll bring in Andy, who you've met. Uh, Dor who you've met. And I will try to reconnect. I'm going to try to reconnect the quiz while you guys chat amongst yourselves. I wonder, would it be rude of me to take a comfort break after two and a half hours of streaming? Yes. <laughs> very rude. It would be very rude. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'll do a quick. You go for it, brother. Andy, how you doing? Looking good? You too, Scott. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Doc? Doc. Cheers, Scott. Been a great Cheers, night. Good to see you again. Have you had a nice night, Andy? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I, I have had a nice night as well. It's been frantic and fast-paced, but that's often the case uh, with that, ba that bang was weird, you know. I know. And, and I know I that... Played it, I played the video back, and that, that plant was moving like hell. Well, it must be when the fan it, was pointing at the plant, like now. Look. It's moving okay, now. Okay, yeah. So I've got a but fan... That's, that's kind of just to me, it sounded like something dropped on the floor. Yeah, it was. It was weird. It was weird. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. I'll, I'll tell you a story one day. I won't do it now, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story about oh, what I'm. What I'm going to have to do is is fathom, investigate, and work out what it is. And when I discover what it is, I'll share with everyone. On an upcoming <laughs> VPUG pub, what caused the big explosion <laughs> live? We are still, there's still no smoke, there's still no fire, there's no electrical smell or anything. We're in good shape. So let's uh, let's get rid of that one and bring in that one. Here we go. I'm sorry that the stream's gone on so late tonight, um, but it, there was an inevitability to it. Did I miss? Oh, I didn't miss a, a, a chat. Did a super chat coming in? No, I think I got it. Are we just, we're just guessing and keeping our uh, guesses to ourselves, like everybody. Absolutely. You can do exactly as you want. You can follow the crowd if you like. I have to say that there are a few questions in this tonight that my friend Jimmy Legg, Blair, in the, in the, in the lounge, would call asshat questions. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is to make a couple of them more difficult to Google, right, Doc? I'm gonna, uh, that makes sense. I'll cover the chat up so I can't see anything. Okay, good luck, everybody. Ten questions, multiple choice, all you're just keeping your own score. You're only playing against yourself. So good luck. As we go into question one and ask, Art Beg produced an unpeated Highland style, much in the same as Kalila did. Whiskey from 89 to 96. But what did they call it? Their unpeated Art Beg was called A, Kildalton, B, Blasda, or C, Kelpie. What was Art Beg's Highland style whiskey called? This is back in the days crazy to consider now that Isla Whiskey wasn't nearly in the same demand as it is in today, so they had to switch production for a certain part of the time. Mikey Hay has just bought me a super chat, you star Mikey, saying Slancheroy. Slancher, my friend Mikey. Um, it's been a long time since we've raised a class together. Let it be soon, my friend. Thank you, Mikey. Looks like everybody's getting that one. <laughs> Okay, this is fantastic. Fantastic. I'm looking for Has some... anybody tried it? Has anybody tried the Blazda? Uh, Blazda may be an unpeated me... expression or a, a lightly peated expression from Ardbeg, but that's not what I'm asking. Their completely unpeated style, made from 89 to 96, was called Kildalton. Kildalton. <laughs> Has anybody tried it? Asking. Can I just give a, can I give a shout out to Marvin Michlitz? Um, Because he looks like, along with Skog Smart, the only people that got that one right. So that's a banana skin, and, right? And Jimmy Leck, it seems, and Marvin as well. I am bringing hate on the channel. I'm sorry, Barflies. I'm sorry, Lounge. Um, no, that was one of the hat hat questions. Is an ass hat question? You're going to find a bit of a roller coaster with the quiz tonight. There's going to be lots of these, 
and then you're going to find them to be quite comfortable and easy. Which of these could be a significant factor in Brook Laddie and Bunahaven being a primarily non-peated Isla style? This would have been a difficult one if I hadn't just shared it earlier in the stream. Is it flat topped stills? Is it flat sided kilns? Or is it flat bottomed boats? How did Buna Haven and Brookladdy, both incidentally founded in the same year, 1881, how did they end up on the Isla of, uh, sorry, the island of Isla, making an unpeated or lightly peated style? Lily Dolier is saying C, puffers, and the whole entire lounge is screaming C. C for coal, Jimmy Legg is saying, absolutely. Fantastic. I can tell you that indeed it was the access by sea from flat bottomed puffers meant that it was easy and efficient to get coal onto the island so they didn't need to use peat as a fuel. Very curious. How are you getting on, guys? Two for two. Nod if it's two for two. <laughs> no nodding. Okay, let's move on to question three and ask. Kalila was once a flora and fauna release featuring what on the label? What did the flora and fauna Kalila have? Was it an otter, a seal, or a seagull? I have proof here. What did the 15-year-old Kalila flora and fauna release have? Is it an, all the flora and fauna have some kind of animal on there, some kind of bird, or mammal, fish thing? Um, but let's see. Andy, do you know? Aye. You're thinking A, the doc is saying what? It could be A as well. I'm not, not sure. Okay, he's saying B, but potentially A. Scott, are you guessing? I'm guessing. I know it's not an otter because there's another flora and fauna that has an otter on it. So it was between the seal and the seagull. And I've guessed B on the other two, and that hasn't been right. So I took B on this one. It's got to be right. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be B for a <laughs> Absolutely right. Jimmy Legg is saying seal B, it better not be C. Uh, good. Uh, uh, you would think that you're in some kind of law enforcement with that deduction, Scott, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There is a C on the Kalila. Now, I, I thought that lots of people would guess otter because one of the fantastic things you can see if you get up early enough oh, in the right. morning, I have not, is to go to Kalila and see the sea otters there and the sound. Yeah. Well, is there is there not another uh, bottle with the otter on it already? That's what I thought there was. Uh, I think that you're probably right. I'm not sure which one it is, but I think um, which would have the otter. There's there? definitely one with an otter, but yeah. I'm not sure which one. Yeah. yeah, and that's cool that you know that, Scott, because you don't even get the flora and fauna releases out there. Well, and that's just because of you, because you've uh, a while back you'd gone over a lot of the flora and faunas with us and sent us a few samples. Matter of fact. Yeah. It's a it's a definitely a guilty pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I do enjoy it. Fantastic. Question four. Lagavulin is typically peated at what level? I did give this away, not only earlier tonight, but also gave it away on a patron-only lock-in on Sunday night. But I think it's such a cool question that I, I included it again. We've already discussed it. Is it A, a bit less than 34 ppm? These are you have to imagine Ian MacArthur saying these words or is it around about 34 to 38 ppm or is it a wee bit more than 38 ppm and here we are i think it's a giveaway for all of you three as well is that right no i don't know on yeah. this one <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got it right last time yep it was uh i mentioned it earlier on in the stream i can tell you that as the whole entire crowd knows um, yeah, Jimmy Legg is saying, this is an ASAT question, but I know it now. <laughs> Do you see the uh, the emoji that he's using, Scott, in the chat? No. I've got have it look, covered up. Have a look at the YouTube chat for a second. You'll see the Jimmy Legg's emoji that he's using. You might like it. Oh, very nice. <laughs> yeah. Available for a limited time only. I got to know how to get that. <laughs> On the Aquavitae channel. <laughs> Absolutely. The whole entire lounge is correct. Yeah, right. You guys are right as well. B, 34 to 38 ppm. Lagavulin malt specification. For when you said you got you to gotta hear it in Ian's voice, I can hear him saying that. 
Yes. <laughs> so you so go to four to thirty-eight ppm. <laughs> so here's a here's a different uh, uh, image for the picture question at the halfway point. We're looking at an aerial image from Google Maps. And I want to ask what distillery, of course, are we looking at? The theme tonight for the quiz is clearly Isla. Is it A, Brook Laddie, B, Lefroig, or C, Kalila? What are we looking at here? This is going to be tough for a lot of folk, I think. But if you've been here, you're going to spot it and you're going to know it. I think this could be tricky for a lot of people, especially since I've flipped it around 180 degrees. <laughs> oh, that's nasty, nasty that is. <laughs> and what's interesting is the black bar at the top is covering the inverted and back to front Google. I thought that that would yeah. give it a look, but now I've got to I've got to say that I did that to it. So this is not a northerly aspect water we're seeing here. It's southerly. Um, I'm going to go with that. Doc, what do you think? Uh, I said Lefroig. Andy? Lefroig? Lefroig. Scott? You're well, right. I thought it was Lefroig until you said it was flipped 180, and then I because I thought that was how Lefroig's warehouses was going, so I went Kalila. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you talked yourself out of it. Bit sneaky of me, Scott. I do apologize. If anybody answered B for Kalila, you're absolutely right. Most of the, the majority of it seemed coming in later did. Um, once I'd admitted that I'd flipped it around a wee bit, but we're looking at Lefroy. Normally that would be a southerly aspect. Here's another asshat question. Which island might you see lying south of Lefroy and Lagavulin? Is it A, Texa, B, Kanza, C, Origa? Ooh. That's a good one. It's that a is. small island that was once inhabited. It's no longer inhabited. There is church ruins over there. So there were clearly people that went over to this island at some point in Isla's history. Very small Ooh. island. You can see it from Lagavulin. You can see it from Lefroy on a clear day. Is it A, Texa, B, Kansas, or C, Origa? Given the Google factor of this, we'll be fast at it. Commit. I know you're guessing, Scott. Just guess. I said, I guessed A, Texa. Andy, guess. C, Origa. Doc, guess. A as well, Texa. I can tell you that you're both oh, correct. Yeah. Andy, unlucky on the guess, my friend, that is Texa. It's the Isle of Texa on the south of Isla. Very small. Don't know if they do any kind of uh, tours out there or whatever, but it's teeming with wildlife now, apparently, but no people. Question seven. I think one uh, of the Johnstons is, is buried there, if I'm not mistaken, on Texa. Oh, Wow. Nice. So doing your doing your research of Lefroig, then you managed yes. to Yeah, good <laughs> right. for you. Uh, our beg, which of the following releases are not currently core range? Not core range. 19-year-old Trey Van, 21-year-old 20 something, or the non-age statement Anno. Which is not core range? <laughs> the 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 interesting feedback I get for these quizzes is fascinating to me. <laughs> uh, Ardbeg, which is not core range. Okay, the crowd are answering. Uh, they're a knowledgeable, knowledgeable crowd. Scotty, what do you think? 21-year-old, uh, 20 20-something. Andy, no need to ask. Yeah. Doc, no need to ask. <laughs> Same thing. Absolutely. The 19-year-old Trayvon and the Anno are both core range now, and the 20-something is a limited release, of course. But the Trayvon will come in batches, I understood. Sorry? The Trayvon is coming in batches, so there's no... Yeah, so it's like an annual release, that's right. Uh, well, annual co is going to be part of the core range and uh, yeah. part of their uh, fixed. It's not limited. It's going to be a continual thing. Eight, which Isla Distillery has used the marketing tagline Westering Home? A... Now, I'm rushing now because you can tell I really need that comfort break, right? <laughs> A, Bunahaven, B, Kilhoman, or C, Bamor. Which of those distilleries was once Westering Home? Steve A, thanks for helping me out with the quiz tonight. Keeping things in line. I need to ask everybody after the ninth question how you're all getting on. I can see McAllen Fine and Rare Doc is answering. Wow, okay. A few people... The majority, I think, are correct on this one. Scott, what do you think, Westering Home? I guess Kilhoman, because it's west of Bunahaven. 
Uh, Andy, what do you think? I was going to go kill Herman. And Doc? Uh, hey. uh, wow. It's indeed. No! It's actually in the video, but it's hard to make out. As you and Bart walk down the stairs into the still room, there's a kind of an image of um, uh, the old Bunahavin logo type with the sailor, and he's kind of got his hand above his, his head like that, and underneath it says Westering Home. So there you go. They don't use it anymore, unfortunately. It's not in modern bottlings, but it was once associated with Buna Haven. Second to last question, question nine. What is done with Bamor's excess production heat? Come on, I'm giving you some freebies now. This is mm. what, what is done with an excess heat? Is it it heats a swimming pool? Or it's recirculated for efficiency? Or is it it warms the harbour and pier? What happens to the Excess production heat from Bamor. A, swimming pool. B, recirculated for efficiency. Or C, it warms the harbour and pier. All of these are Googleable, but I'm trying to go a wee bit quicker <laughs> tonight because my back teeth are floating. <laughs> okay. Any guesses? Doc, what do you think? A. I know and for a fact. I've been there. Hey. They told me. Scott. I got to go B because we were there, Roy, and you didn't take us swimming at Beaumont. <laughs> <laughs> I must have missed it from the itinerary. I do apologize. But it is indeed. The excess heat from Beaumont heats the local swimming pool, which is nearby. So if you answer there, give yourself a point. And in the, in the chat, please tell me, everybody, how you're getting on. That's after nine. Scotty, how are you doing tonight? You got a pass mark? I'm a four at four out of nine so far. So we need another one from you to get a pass mark. Andy, how are you getting on? I I, I ain't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not bothered. I'm you just, just enjoying it. Yeah, no, not really. Pass mark, honestly. And Doc, how are you? I'm at eight out of nine. I screwed eight the first out of nine. Only missing, only slipping up on eight one. Eight out of nine. Show off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Orange wool is on eight out of nine. <laughs> Scotch Four Dummies is in. Fantastic to see you guys. I hope it's Mark, Drew, Sean, Andrew. I hope you're all here on three out of three so far. Too funny. Greg's Whiskey Guys, six. I'm looking for the high scores now. McCallum Fine and Rare on eight. Nine out of nine. Nine out of nine. Yeah, I saw some nines. Who, so, who was that? Scogsmart. Scogsmart. Yeah. Rich on eight. Yeah. Looking for the next Scogsmart. Oh, nine. Scogsmart has nine out of nine. Nine, nine out of nine. nine. Alistair Gray on eight. So a few eights, you see, and Skogsmard, yep, he's the guy on 9 out of 9. You're the only guy that has the potential of getting 10 out of 10. But the big thing is, is that did I make the last question tonight? Oh, and Andrew Butler as well. 9 out of 9. We've got somebody else. Andrew Butler. Andrew Butler, 9 out of 9, Charlie McLean levels. So it's between Skogsmard and Andrew Butler to see who gets a 10 out of 10 on the quiz tonight. Question 10, is it an ass hat question or is it an easy one? In the recent video released on the channel, Scott and Bart attempted to walk into which water? <laughs> did they try to walk into the Sound of Isla? Or did they walk into the Atlantic Ocean? Or did they walk into Loch Endal? In the recent video on the channel, I released Scotch, uh, Scotch Test Dummies Visit uh, Scotland uh, number two. It was all about Isla on this episode. And uh, you can see them with their jeans rolled up trying to walk into the freezing cold water of either A, the sound of Isla, B, the Atlantic Ocean, or C, Loch and Dal. Now we're looking here for Skogsmard and Andrew Butler to see how they answer. Uh, 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 I'm looking, looking, can't find Skogsmard quite yet. Well, here's this is where we know who's watched the video and who is yet to watch the video. Scott, what water did you walk into? Well, I, I knew it as Makir Bay. That's what yeah. I know. Yeah. Yes. So I'm guessing the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> okay. And Doc? Uh, oh, Atlantic Ocean as well. Absolutely. It was Mafia Bay. Right. You're right on it. It was the Atlantic Ocean. Scott <laughs> gets his pass mark. Yeah, I got five out of ten. <laughs> Andy still doesn't know where he is, but he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> His Doc scores a fantastic um, nine out of ten. Nine, nine, yep. <laughs> Skogsmard and Andrew Butler is Skogsmard said B scored a 10 out of 10 well done 
and Andrew Butler, Andrew Butler, where are you, Andrew? Anybody else can see him. It's really hard to see. I, I want to commiserate or congratulate one or the other. Andrew Butler, hooray, 10 out of 10. Fantastic, Andrew. Very good. Congratulations. So let's raise a wee glass to the two 10 out of 10 guys tonight, Andrew and Scogs Marlin. Say well done, boys. Well done. Uh, I can relax. Well done. Well done. A bit of a Tuesday night, quite an intense night. Um, I knew it was going to be like that. I knew that this theme was going to be difficult to manage a wee bit. But can I say thanks so much to Ben as well, who's not who's not managed to stay around. Obviously, he's working as well. Can I say thanks to Andy, you star, for hosting us at Ardbeg. Thanks to the doc for hosting us at Kalilistan and for Roddy and host, hosting us at Lagavulin. And thanks, Scott, for joining us after your long day at work, my friend. Fielding front line, no doubt, um, and joining us to host us in a haven. Thanks. To, I've got so much with you. To drink. <laughs> I have to be careful. But thanks to everyone for another fantastic VPUB. Please be sure um, to stay tuned. I'm going to try to bring more VPUBs, as you know, so patrons will know when they're going out first and I'll, I'll, I'll feed through regular social media channels. If you're subscribed to the channel, click the bell icon on the YouTube channel and you'll get notifications of when I schedule a live stream for future. But I'm going to try and do more of these things to keep the community active and together and enjoying whiskey in these difficult and challenging times. Can I raise a glass to my guests tonight and say, you stars, thank you so much for joining me and being so indulgent and patient in the in the green room tonight. And thanks for your contribution. Thank you, Roy. Cheers, and everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Roy. Scott, thank everybody. Doc. All right, thank boys. Thanks, Doc. guys. Stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. Thank you, you wonderful barflies, you wonderful whiskey folk. And I'll see you on the next VPUB. There could be one on Sunday. I'll let you know. I think it's more likely to be a week from now on another Thursday night. I'll see you very soon. Thank you. Slanchava. Gummies.